Bon après-midi, messieurs et madame, tous les mondes, je suis Guillaume et c'est time pour le jeudi après lundi, whatever, the, just before Friday, Monday morning podcast, what's going on? How are you? Comment allez-vous? Sorry, I was practicing my French. He's going again with the French. Here he goes again. What's he going to do first? Learn French or actually quit cigars? Je ne sais pas, monsieur. Um, all right, before we get started, Happy New Year, and I got some information for you. My buddy, my homie, the Rose Bowl tailgate legend, uh, Joe Bartnick, is going off on his first headlining tour. I'm so proud of the guy. Monday morning podcast listeners, you got to go out and support this guy. This guy does the real deal as far as I'm concerned when it comes to stand-up. If you live in Ohio... O-H-I-O, Columbus, Ohio, home of your scarlet and gray Buckeyes. Joe Bartnick, January 11th, will be headlining the Funny Bone. Shout out to Dave Stroop. Uh, January 14th, Joe Bartnick is bringing his new hour to the Stress Factory in New Jersey. Shout out to Vinny. Hey, it fell off the truck. Brand. And then on January 25th, 25th? January 25th. Uh, uh, Philadelphia. Don't call it a Philly cheesesteak, Philadelphia. It's just a fucking cheesesteak. Uh, he's at the Parks Casino in Philadelphia, January 25th. Um, you know, go there and check him out. Then one last thing I have to promote is one of my own dates. I'm going to be a small part of the Bon Scott tribute concert that Dean Del Rey puts on. And I got to tell you, if you're anywhere near LA, you got to come to this show. It's at the Avalon right across the street from um, Capitol Records, which is a great selfie, by the way. Or if you go with somebody else, that's a great picture, legendary place. Um, January 9th, this Tuesday, um, we're going to be... Uh, We're going to be doing, Dean's putting on this. It's basically, it's a stand-up show followed by a full-on tribute concert to ACDC's Bon Scott, the Bon Scott era. Dean actually absolutely kills it on main vocals, and he's going to have all of these rock stars that his buddies from his time when he was doing music are going to come down, and yours truly is going to jam on two ACDC songs. Not easy songs. I don't know why I, I picked them, but uh, I picked them because I love them. But they are not easy songs to play, so it's been a nice challenge for me. Uh, that's going to be this Tuesday at the Avalon. There's still a few tickets left. I'm telling you, I, the last one we did was like literally the day before the pandemic, and I still get the occasional tweet or Instagram message from fans going like, I just want to say that was one of the coolest fucking combination shows. It's a killer stand-up show followed by an absolutely epic Uh, concert and uh, it's all pro musicians except for me <laughs> I'm the bathroom break guy and uh, it's just fantastic so um, with that here we are here we are going into the first week I am uh, three days trois jours, into uh, this fucking fast that I went on to just sort of Keep all of my demons at bay. Uh, it's obviously not to lose weight because when you fast, what happens? They, you take your muscle. Muscle burns fat. You become actually a little more squishy, a little more fleshy there. But um, I am not. Uh, I'll tell you, the first day of it wasn't bad. It was just water with lemon and some like electrolytes. Wasn't bad at all. Um I don't know. It just wasn't bad. But like the last two days has been like bone broth. Ugh. And, you know, everybody buys the chicken because it sort of just tastes like the end of chicken noodle soup if you heat it up. But this fucking bone broth. Oh, my God. This it's it drinking bone broth like room temperature bone broth, it, like beef is like being in a relationship with someone you never really loved in the first place. And it's just another fucking day with them. And you're like, what am I have to get out of this? <laughs> Now, as I've stated for years, I am German Irish, which means I can pretty much block out 98% of feelings if need be in order to survive. 
unless you get to death of a friend, a family member, or literally torture. Um, anything else, I'm just like, whatever, I'll just fucking plow through it. It's, it's the blessing and the curse of having that blood flowing through my veins. And I will tell you, this is the only thing uh, I've always done well with, like, dieting, and I can just do it. I just get into the whole difficulty of it, and I sort of, I don't know why, I just, I actually enjoy it, struggling in the difficult parts of life. I don't know why. And when good things are happening, I'm always looking for the other shoe to drop in a way. Like, you know, oh, dude, the crowd's great. The crowd's great. And I'm thinking like, oh, what if I bomb? And then everybody's like, the crowd was great. The only person who bombed was Bill, you know, or, or and then I, I, when I felt way more pressure when I was coming up. If somebody said, oh, dude, the crowd's fucking awful, bunch of meatheads and shit. I actually would do way better because there was no pressure. I'm supposed to do bad. So then I would go up there relaxed and um, everything you do relaxed is just better, which I am learning with drums. I have this new way of practicing taught to me by the great Dave Elich. Rather than, you know, trying to make it happen, just relax. And I, I just, rather than like trying to play stuff up to tempo, my new thing is how relaxed can I play this? At what tempo does it stop being relaxed? And fuck that back off. <laughs> Drums are supposed to be fun. They're not supposed to be stressful. I remember a long time ago, I can't believe I have this story, is I did this benefit in downtown LA and one of the drummers playing on it is one of my all-time favorites because I just feel like he just has the most killer feel and he's so creative and really with just a four-piece kit did more with that thing then a lot of the guys, his contemporaries, were doing with like double bass kicks and three rack, two floor, and all of these fucking cymbals. He just got more goddamn music out. The great Steven Adler. And uh, I went down there, and he's always just like get the most positive energy. And he was saying, and he said, what well, he, he told me, he goes, make sure you smile. Don't forget to smile and relax. And when you watch him play, that's how he plays. And it just sounds so fucking good. And I didn't quite understand it. Because I was thinking, relax. It's like I am completely out of my element here. I need to be between my ears thinking what I'm going to do. And like, it was just, some, I, I didn't, I still sat down and didn't quite do what he told me. But then I watched him play. And taking lessons with Dave was a combination of both of them. So thank you to both of them that I finally got. It's like, oh, when you play relaxed, it sounds better. It sounds more powerful. It has more flow to it or whatever. So it's something I've been working on because, uh, you know, I'm off the road. I'm not on the road right now. And if I have nothing to do, all of my bullshit catches up with me and I go into a depression. So I need new things because I've kind of put to bed everything that happened to me up until this point in my life. But no matter how much you put it to bed, it still happens. And occasionally you're going to fucking think about it or just revisit it or whatever. And then, as I call it, the fog, the smoke catches up with you. So then I'm like, oh, maybe I should start learning some French. Maybe I should take some drum lessons. Hey, there's a new place to get coffee. Let me fucking go. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep me mentally uh, VFR rather than instrument rates, yeah, via, uh, IFR for you pilots out there. So anyway, that is what I'm doing. I am kind of elated that I am at the end of this, this fast. And the big, big thing, if you ever do a fast, is like by the end of it, like if you're out in the country and you see a cow, you start thinking of just being doing what a bear would do which is just tackle the thing and just start biting meat out of its back. Like, that's what I feel like <laughs> with my fucking horse teeth here. This is what the, I'm thinking of doing. Um, I was on Instagram and they had the top 10 places to get a burger. And I was looking at that shit yesterday, drinking this room temperature beef bone broth. And all I was thinking is like, I'm going to all fucking 10 of those places and I am getting a burger. Maybe, you know, 10 in a row tomorrow. And that's kind of a really bad way to come out of a 
fast. So my buddy was saying, you know, maybe get some avocados, some walnuts, um, cantaloupe, just something that's easy um, to kind of ease your way back in because I had I went to a birthday party last night and they had steak frites, they had this pasta, they had uh, they had some chicken and they had this giant birthday cake and I am just sitting there drinking ice water with lemon and uh, you know everybody knew so they were all fucking teasing me and one of my buddies was going like you can just sit here and do this it's like dude I am about ready to fucking just stick my face in any fucking plate here and I didn't and when I left it's just a great party just a really good mix of people and when I left I got in my truck and out loud to nobody as I made this illegal U-turn I just said, I could eat 10 cheese pizzas. <laughs> and I just started laughing because I said it so matter-of-factly and I knew I wasn't lying. Now, obviously, I couldn't eat 10 cheese pizzas, but I would definitely be up for it. Um, so anyway, I'm going to, uh, I had a really, other than smoking a cigar every fucking day from July until the end of November, which was really a massive failure on my part maybe 15 or 20 days I didn't um I but I I lived a lot healthier last year as far as not eating eating desserts and shit like that so then something always has to go off the rails so my new thing is I think if like once a month I do this three-day fast because somewhere through the second day it's like your rational brain just takes over and you start looking at you can just look at food and other habits like smoking and all of that objectively, like why would I do that? Where all of the other times when you're sort of in the throes of it, salt, sugar, salt, sugar, smoke, 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 caffeine, it's it's a different version of you that is sort of like a hysterical woman that needs to be slapped in an old school movie. <laughs> oh my God. Can you imagine if you came up with a machine that shook your shoulders and slapped you across the face like one of those 1950s movies. Like, for Christ's sake, get a hold of yourself. No, you know, for goodness sakes, they didn't curse. I love it they wouldn't curse, but you could hit a woman. Um, get a hold of yourself. Psh, psh. It was always like one, two, right? Um, which Airplane made fun of so hilariously uh, in their movie like 20 years after those things. Um, It'd be funny if you had like, you know, like, you know, like those karate people have like that, that fucking white dude. It's that same white dude. He, and what I love about him is he, he doesn't look like somebody you could beat up. He definitely looks like he's a strong guy, but he's missing a whole body and he can't move. The one that you kick and punch and all of that. Or that 49ers fan punches in the face when he does, when he's talking about the game. I've seen those clips. It's hilarious. If you had one of those, but you added like hands that could grab your shoulders, like you adjust it to how wide your shoulders are. And, you know, when you know that you're going to eat something, smoke something, do something you shouldn't fucking do, it just shakes you and goes, for God's sakes, get a hold of yourself. And it gives you a forehand and a backhand across the face. Um, just, to, just, to, just to wake you up again. I don't know. I don't know if any of this makes sense. I just, like, I need to fucking... I'm ready. My fast ends at nine o'clock tonight, but I'm just going to go till tomorrow morning because I don't want to eat a bunch of shit before I go to bed. So I'm going to start eating tomorrow morning. And during the fast, like everything I ordered had to do with food. Like I'm obsessed with learning how to make a, uh, a ham and cheese uh, jambon avec fromage, a fromage uh, crepe. And um, I bought the pan with the little fucking squeegee that comes with it. And I actually looked I wrote in French how to make one because I want somebody French to teach me how to do it and what was funny was I've watched enough food um, videos that I can kind of tell if somebody knows what they're doing or if they don't so the first one was a woman and she had this shitty pot and a shitty stove so right there I gotta go okay maybe she doesn't make a lot of money, but she's one of these people that you go to her house and she just makes, regardless of her situation and her equipment, she just has the gift. Like how uh, Jack White can fucking take a Sears store-bought guitar back in the day and make it sound better 
than, you know, some dad guitarist with a fucking vintage Les Paul, right? So I'm going, all right, let me watch this person. And where she lost me is when you go to make the crepe, you're doing like the well method, like Mario Batali, uh, rest his soul. <laughs> Uh, Molto Mario, rested soul, um, used to do the well method. And I remember you put the three eggs in there and then you gradually incorporated the flour. And I was watching all of these French uh, people doing it and I got to hers because the picture of, of, of the croissant looked, not the croissant, the crepe looked really good. She just, she made the well and she put the eggs in there. And I think she said in French, but you can do the well thing, but it doesn't really matter. I just throw it. So she threw, put all her milk in and all the other shit and stirred it up. It still looked all right, but I really believe slowly adding the liquids to the, to the powdered shit, right? To the, the, to the solids, whatever the fuck you call it. So I found this other guy and he had a professional kitchen and he did the well method and he slowly added the water. So, um... I don't even know what I'm talking about or how long that fucking story took, but that's basically what I've been doing as I am patiently waiting for this Michigan Wolverine Washington Huskies game on Monday, uh, which I think is going to be a fucking classic because I kind of did a little bit of research on the Washington Huskies quarterback and he's had, he's had to come back from two ACL injuries and he did. That's the big thing. People will talk about, oh, he hurt his knees twice. Yeah, and you know what he did? He fucking came back both times, dominated, and led his team to the championship game. So um, I know the spread right now is minus four, but I think that's just because a lot of people, you know, they show up for the big game, and they saw Michigan beat Alabama. And I don't think that they realize that Alabama, you know, like Nick Saban did an incredible job with that team this year because, I, I, you know, they kind of started off rocky. They, they always have a loss in fucking September, but he righted the ship. But I, I, I just think they didn't have the replacement players that they usually have. Um, so I think it's a pick em. And I'm obviously rooting for Michigan, but I think it would be really cool to see the Huskies win a championship. Uh, like, I wouldn't be mad at that. You know, if it was fucking USC or one of those fucking teams – that you just seen too many times in the course of my lifetime. I'd be like, fuck these guys, right? I, I mean, I am rooting for Michigan, but I, I, it'll, it'll be a lot easier to lose to the Huskies, who I didn't think they had won a championship since the 1950s, and I just found out on the Anything Better podcast that they actually won one in 1991 with Mark Brunel, the great Jacksonville Jaguars quarterback. Um, so, um, anyway, I know I'm fucking yammering on like I'm on coke I am allowed to have coffee during this fast but I only do one a day one a day plus iron like the fucking Geritol so I had one double espresso before this I'll tell you you know what's fucking rough I'll tell you what's rough I'll tell you what a rough one is room temperature beef bone broth followed by a double espresso like I was all excited like oh my god something with flavor ugh it, it just all kind of tastes the same at this point. I mean, that's, I almost have to apologize for you to even have you guys to imagine chasing room temperature beef bone broth with a fucking double espresso. I mean, I might as well have just drank it out of a fucking ashtray. Um. <laughs> oh, my God. What I could do with a hamburger stand right now. I, I, oh my God, like I could fucking walk. That's why when you come out of a fast, you have to go, I feel they say to go easy. It's it, half of it is so you don't shock your digestive system. The other half is so you don't undo everything you just did. Cause uh, I am a huge, huge fan of the taco stands out here, taco trucks. And the hamburger stands, like those, those, those those little ones. They almost look like back in the day, remember when Kodak, right outside the Kmart, used to have like their, we'll develop your films in fucking 24 hours. Your, 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 uh, not your films, your film from your, your camera or whatever. They're like that size. I fucking love those places. 
And uh, I don't think I've ever been to a bad one. The, the worst they are is not as good as a great one. But I, I, I mean, there's just something about it. You're outside, you know, and I usually just go with the burger. I'm not into the fries anymore. I'm too fucking old to handle that. But just a fucking burger and a root beer, you know, I don't know. There's something about it. Sun's out out here. You feel like you're skipping school, like you should be doing something and you're not. Um, oh, my God. I'm back into talking food again. This might be the most insane I've been on any fucking podcast where I keep my the, the, the logical part of my brain keeps going, Bill, will you stop talking about food? And I can't help it. It's like I'm talking about this girl that broke up with me and I never got over it. You know, you ever have that buddy? You know, I had a couple. I had one buddy like that and I always knew when it was going to happen. I could almost time it by what he was drinking. If it was beers, he'd have to be a little deeper in. He'd have to be like five in and he would get that look on his face. And I, I was be like, all right, number seven, he's going to come to me and it's going to be, it's going to be on. And, uh, but if he was drinking scotch, it was two, two scotches in, he'd start to get surly. And then, and then here we go. It's 1983 again. <laughs> Um, for me, it was never a woman. For me, for the longest time, it was sporting events. It was game six of the 86 World Series. It was, uh, there was never really any Patriots thing. We just always, I was never expecting us to win a Super Bowl. Out of all the championships we won, the, that first Super Bowl we won was more surprising to me than the World Series. Um, yeah. It was never the loss to the Yankees. Like, the Bucky Dent one I was too young for. It was the 86 one. That was my Bucky Dent game. And then the Aaron Boone one, it happened, but before it took root, we won the next year. So it never you know, quite took hold. Um, basketball, it was 87. That first time we lost to the Lakers and they won the championship in the Boston Garden. I always remember Kareem hit another sky hook that like, it was already iced and then it was definitely iced. And he ran up to court and he fucking, both his fists was like, yeah. And then they, they celebrated in the Boston Garden and historically, back then, the Lakers always lost to the Celtics. They had never beaten us in the final uh, NBA finals. That's the plural one. Stanley Cup finals. Stanley Cup finals. Um, and they, they celebrated in the Boston Garden and drank champagne there. And I bet all the championships that they won, I bet if you asked Magic or Kareem, there was no sweeter champagne than the one, the, the champagne they drank in the visitor's locker room. Uh, I still remember where I watched that game, and I remember walking out of my buddy's house into the street, and uh, we, I was, it, was, it was like, yeah, it was awful. And that was like less than a year after fucking... The Red Sox. But the Red Sox, she expected it. The Celtics was just like, they just win. They, they fucking win. And it was also Len Bias died. 86 was fucking brutal. Len Bias died. We fucking blew it. And uh, the Celtics won it all. And then it was just Len Bias died. Bill Buckner. The Patriots getting absolutely fucking smoked. Against the, the 85 bear. Oh, that was 85. So the beginning of the year was that. Yeah. The Celtics winning the championship was the 86. Oh, I'll tell you, that was a rough one. Okay. Um, There's a good question. If you come from a city with uh, three or four major sports teams, or maybe even just two, like Buffalo. Um, what uh, the worst sports year versus the best. Um, 
I'd say the best for us was 2004, beating the Yankees, finally winning a World Series, and then also winning a Super Bowl, our third one that year, I think. And then the worst year in sports, I would say, was 86 with uh, the Buckner loss and Len Bias dying. Um, was just fucking brutal. That was so bad. I mean, and also, like, can you imagine, okay, the Lakers, you know, what they would have to do to deal with the fact that we had the Celtics finally had a Showtime Laker level player um, who used to go blow for blow <clears throat> in games against Michael Jordan in college. Um, not saying we definitely would have won it, but just watching that whole franchise have to deal with that um, would have caused, if you can believe this, Magic and Kareem and Worthy to have to elevate their game from where it was. I mean, you know, even if we lost, even if we still fucking lost, just like what you missed out on a fan, forget about seeing a kid in the prime of his life about to make the full dream come true, pass away like that. It's fucking brutal. Which is sad. Why would I bring that up? It's the, the, it's the new year, right? Everybody, we're doing stuff this year. We're not going to let 24-hour networks divide us anymore. We're going to come together. We're going to have more empathy, right? Liberals, conservatives, centrists. Uh... Faith in humanity, something. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know what the fuck else to talk about. I will not talk about food. Oh, is it any better than a fucking Reuben? Oh. Two eggs over easy, hash browns, bacon, a cup of fucking coffee, and today's newspaper in a diner. Like, if there was a genie right now and he granted me three wishes, you'd think you'd go with world peace the first fucking time. The first wish would be that. <laughs> and then world peace. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, so please, guys, go see uh, Joe Bartnick. I can't, I can't think of anybody else that deserves who's been working as long as he has. He's so excited to do these dates, and I, he was at the Rose Bowl and uh, he was telling me how excited he was about his new material. And uh, I could just feel his energy that he is going to do some fucking damage. And those you, you will not regret the money you spend seeing him, nor if you live in the L.A. area. If you want to come down, see me and Dean do some stand up. And then all these amazing musicians uh, tip their cap to the great Bon Scott and one of the greatest bands of all time, ACDC. That, that show's on Tuesday. And um, I don't know. Uh, je ne sais pas. I don't know what else I have for you. I think that's it. All right. Um, Happy New Year once again to everybody. Uh, I'm going to do a bunch of spots around town here in L.A. And I am going to uh, polish off this new 15 that I have. And uh, I'm going to tape a special this year. That's the plan anyway. And... Um, I have all my dates on my website. I have a few surprise ones that are in the works that I am very, very excited about. And, uh, you know, I want to be at the top of my fucking game mentally and physically, you know, go out there and give you guys your money's worth. Because as I've said a bunch of times, I can't tell you guys how much I appreciate the fact that you listen to this podcast and you give a fuck enough to go to my shows and you watched old dads and you watched Leo. So um, I have no plans on phoning anything in. Never did, never will. So thank you in advance if you come out to any of my shows. And if you don't, I understand you're fucking busy, whatever. Just have a good year this year. All right. And uh I don't know. I'm hoping regular people can fucking come together and stop listening to these fucking sociopaths that are trying to divide us. All right. I'm off my I'm off my. Uh, I usually say tree stump, but now I will say butcher block because that's all I can fucking think of right now is ordering fucking some food from them. All right. That's it. Uh, enjoy the music picked out by the amazing Andrew Themelis. And then we have a bonus episode of the Thursday afternoon 
just before uh, Friday, Monday morning podcast. That's it. You guys have a great weekend, you cunts. And I will check. I will not check in on you. I will talk to you on Monday. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, January 4th, 2016. A brand new year. Brand new year. Brand new you. Are you going to make the changes that you've always wanted to make? When are you going to stop telling yourself you're going to change and actually go out there and change? I always love the pressure. The beginning of the new year to be like, all right, you know, there's that one great thing, right? Like where you're you're like, all right, shaking off the last year, you know, like, I don't know who the fuck that guy was, right? Like lying to yourself, like you're not the same person fucking one minute later when it becomes a new year. Or you do the real childish thing is you blame everybody else for your own fucking problems, you know? Can't wait for this year to be over, man. It's just been so much fucking bullshit this year. It's been like the worst fucking year. I can't wait for the next fucking year. It's like, dude, well, are you going to change anything? Are you going to break up with the person? Are you going to stop getting drunk and being a dick and picking fights in the bar, right? Huh? All of that shit? Or are you just going to think that magically because there's a six there now instead of a five that all of a sudden the world's going to change and you don't have to adjust Oh, am I reprimanding somebody right now? I think I am. I don't know why. I have no idea why. I'm recording this uh, at about 8.30 in the morning. Lost Hangale's time. My wife's still sleeping downstairs, so I got I to gotta try to stay at medium energy. Medium energy here um, for the rest of this fucking podcast. Um, but whatever, I'm kind of, I got to be honest with you. I went to bed last night and I was sad. I love the holidays, and I'm sad that they're fucking over. I had another great, you know, holiday break. And to think that it's all going to fucking start over again, you know? Here we go. Another fucking year of doing the road, writing shit and doing all this stuff. Here we fucking go again. The whole thing just got just totally overwhelming with me. And I was just fucking laying in bed, you know, you know, when you, you fucking look too far ahead into your fucking life, um, you know, it just gets too fucking overwhelming. And then maybe you start hearing the same. The, you know what song I always hear in my head? I always hear that, that song. Make the world go away. Something, something and get it off my shoulders. Um, that's what I feel like. The most pathetic emotion you could have. Make the world go away. And you're just going to go in there. And just pout, you know. I got to ask a question about depression. Uh, is it actually a chemical thing, or is that just an adult world word for like somebody who's just kind of sort of pouting? You know, I think a lot of times when people go, "I'm depressed," it's just you're just kind of feeling sorry for yourself. And you know, the ones that say it's like a chemical imbalance, you just like you just shift your head really quickly. The chemicals go back the other way, and you'll cheer up. You know, don't believe the mainstream media, you know, and all the pharmaceutical companies with their drugs, man. (laughs) Is there anything funnier than when somebody who's not a fucking doctor, you know, just starts going on and on about, let me tell you something, man. I'm telling you, all you got to do is just go up. Walk up to an oak tree. Can't be a birch, can't be a maple. Go up to an oak tree and just bite on the little sapling. You just gnaw on it, right? You got a little piece of bark and you stick it between you, just like chew. You just stick it between your gum and all of that, and your depression will go away. Yeah, it is true. It is true. The Native Americans used to do it, and they were never depressed. That's what they used to do until the white man came and took their bark away. Now look at them. All grumpy, just like the white man. Because they, cause they couldn't get any more saplings with the tree bark there. Um, anyways, uh, Fursey and his wife left yesterday, so the house is empty again. It just stinks, man. I was having a great fucking time enjoying it. Now it's going to all, all fucking starts over again. Um, I'm already starting the year off. My office is a fucking mess. You know, I'm I'm the worst. I can't find the sticker to put on my fucking license plate. I know I got it. I don't know where the fuck it is. It just, it all starts over. It just, fun time's over. 
fun time is over. You know what? We still got the Christmas tree up because Nia liked it extra a lot this year. So I still have to. I still have to go through that sad fucking operation of bringing that goddamn thing outside. And I told you, I disposed that thing like a fucking mob hit. You're never going to find the body. My fucking neighbor already threw his right out on the street. Just tosses it out there, right? Some dead hooker. You know what I mean? Cut the fucking thing up and you put it in the barrel. That's what you do. I get mine in the green barrel, right? We got the green barrels out here, and that's just like grass clippings and all that shit. I have a whole fucking Christmas tree in there, and the lid closes completely. You'd have no fucking idea. I mean, come on, people. How difficult is it? You cut all the branches off, then you just left with the trunk, and then you just section it up. That's it. Drop the thing right the fuck in there. It's not a problem. You wear your safety goggles, you know, so nobody can see you crying as you're doing it. I don't understand what the fucking problem is. Now, God damn it, get out there and dispose of the fucking tree correctly. Um, environmentally, wouldn't it be more correct if you just sort of spread it across your lawn? The tree is just going to end up in a landfill, or even worse, out in the ocean. They don't belong in the ocean. Um, I can't wait to get to this fucking thing later on in this podcast where this guy is trying to claim that the uh, the earth can sustain 100 billion people. I really cannot, I cannot wait. To, I just glanced at it and looked at it, and it's just, I, I just, how the fuck you, you arrived at that number? And I actually tried to find shit. I started looking up how many fucking people the earth can sustain, and uh, what I immediately found was that nobody could say for certain, but the numbers estimated were nowhere near 100 million fucking people. 100 billion, sorry. So I cannot wait to read this guy somehow claiming that there's enough farmland to feed 100 fucking billion people. I don't know. Okay, do we stack each other on top of one another? And even then, do elephants get to roam free anymore? (laughs) Where are all the fucking animals? Um... If there was 100 billion people on the planet, I would think that cannibalism would slowly start to become legal. They would have, uh, they'd have farm people or stock people. That's what they call them. And they would be simply be um, used for food. You know, we just, you know, and of course it would be, uh, you know, the evil white man would decide who it is that gets eaten first. You know, maybe they'd start with like the pygmies or something like that because it'd be like, all right, well, you know, they're uh, they are of a particular race, but they're not as tall as most people in that race. So, you know, they're sort of bite sized. They're like sliders, right? Sliders. They're like human sliders. You know, get a little honey bun, you know, stick a fucking ankle between the two. Right. Why would you eat an ankle? Ankle meat. <laughs> um. So, anyways, I I still feel fucked up from the Rose Bowl, man. I still, you know, I barely got any sleep with Paul being out here. And then we also performed New Year's Eve uh, down the Orpheum. And I bought this suit to wear New Year's Eve. I found it, like, over the summertime. It was this all-white suit, jacket and pants. But, you know, from, from a distance, it reads all white. But when you come up to it, it had these tiny black polka dots. You know what I mean? Just tiny. And uh, I walked into the store and it was on like the fucking 70% off rack because it's really one of those things like, where the fuck are you ever going to wear that? And I saw, I was like, that's a perfect suit for fucking New Year's. You put the black fucking solid black shirt underneath it with a little black pocket square, right? And you walk out there like John Travolta. Well, you can't tell by the way I tell my jokes. I'm a fucking hack. No time for originality. I'm um, sorry. Fucking shit jokes. Fucking shit jokes. I don't like to use concepts. Um, anyways, so that was once again me standing to the side of the stage going like, uh, I am either going to, people either going to like this suit or I'm going to get heckled the entire time I'm out here. But either way, either way, it's going to add to the fucking show. But, uh, as I predicted, it was New Year's. I addressed the suit. I said, this is the only night I could wear it. And people left. And it was a, uh, it was a great fucking time. Great old theater. And I uh, had a bunch of people come out. A um, bunch of friends. You know, people I hadn't seen in a couple of years. People that, you know, 
kind of in my life. It was awesome, man. I love doing New Year's out here in L.A. because uh, I don't have to travel or anything like that, and I get to do the job I love to do. However, I think that's the last New Year's Eve I'll do. I think I'll do like the 30th next time because I got to tell you, the second show ends, right? By the way, I had to do the countdown, like two jokes before my closing joke. I was like halfway through this one bit that I've been trying to work on. I kept fucking up the ending, and I was going to try a new ending to it because the ending was too sad for every fucking city in this nation other than Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas fucking enjoyed the shit out of the original ending. Um and I'm right in the middle of that bit, and I see that it's 11.59. So then I had to get out of the bit, take a pause, and then do the countdown. And then the streamers came out, right? Lovely Nia came out on stage, gave me a kiss. All the guys came. You know, we fucking waved and everything. And then everybody gets off the stage, and then I had to go back into my act, which was, uh, uh, I don't know. It just ended up being funny because it was really weird. So anyways, um, we ended up doing the show. And then as we leave, um, we're stuck in this brutal traffic. I'm like, what the fuck? There must have been something going on because we were in downtown L.A. There must have been something going on um, down at like L.A. Live or some shit down there that's right near the Staples Center. And then I fucking realized the next day it was Motley Crue's final show ever at the Staples Center. And um, so I was like, ah, fuck. That's the traffic we got stuck in. And there's actually a clip up on YouTube of, you know, Tommy Lee, the drummer, does he has a whole fucking roller coaster attached to his drum kit where it turns upside down and it goes out over the crowd and then comes back and all that shit. I mean, the, right there alone, you know, if you're the other members in the band, you got to be like, dude, this better be fucking worth it because the amount of money that's coming out of our checks to fucking carry that rig out on the fucking road. You know what I mean? That's one of those overhead costs. So I don't know if you guys have seen the video. It's their last fucking show ever. And the thing gets stuck. It gets stuck. And Tommy is upside down on this thing. And this roadie scampering up the side of it like the fucking apes in Planet of the Apes when they were on the Golden Gate Bridge, right? They're scampering up the side of this thing. And Tommy's just upside down like, what the fuck, man? The fucking thing's busted. He's like, hey, L.A. He's like, what? You look you look interesting when I'm hanging upside down in Los Angeles. And he's just hanging upside down. It's the most excruciatingly uncomfortable thing I've seen a performer have to go through in a long time. He did what the fuck he could do. I mean, once you just go, well, fuck the roller coaster, man, and you're still hanging upside down. I mean, what do you do? It's just fucking brutal. And the fact that it happened on the very last show, you know, I don't want to start any infighting. I know the band doesn't exist anymore, but I think Vince Neil did it. I think the lead singer probably all these years, you know, he's used to being out front and all the chicks digging him, you know, walking around with his Barbie hair and all that. And then all the drummer goes all the way out over the crowd and everybody's looking at him. And maybe he got sick of it after all these years. The amount of money that was coming out of his paycheck to bring that fucking loop-de-loop roller coaster with the fucking drum kit in it. And he probably went, he probably said, hey, everybody, look at that over there. And then he just pulled a fuse. Uh... That doesn't make any sense, Bill. Then he's sabotaging his own show. Well, you know, I can have a fucking theory. Somebody could just email me with no fucking links or anything whatsoever and just tell me that the earth can sustain 100 billion people. Anyways, so we, uh, we're stuck in that traffic. I didn't get home until like uh, 130, 145. Fell asleep around 2, and then I had to be up at 10 at 10 after 5 to then be outside for the next 13 hours at the uh, at the Rose Bowl. This year we brought eight people and um, one of my buddies who went there, he just called it the Goon Parade. And I got to be honest with you, uh, that's kind of what we were. Um, I don't remember so much of it. I remember the whole game because I just stopped drinking because I had to drive. So I just remember walking to the stadium. And after that, I remember the entire fucking game. Um, 
So I'll take you through what I remember. So we fucking get there, right? First time ever we get there so fucking early. They haven't even opened the gates yet. So when we finally get in, we're parked just outside the VIP parking. I mean, we had like a five-minute walk to the stadium. It was fucking tremendous. And uh, I remember Bartnick giving me a Miller High Life, the big grin on his face because we always have the Miller High Life to start the day. Lawhead got his fucking... Lawhead made it, by the way. He made it, you know. I'll never smile again. Um, He made it. And uh, he got all three of his fires going and getting ready for the breakfast sandwiches. And I want to say that I waited till after I had Lawhead's unbelievable breakfast sandwich. It's the best breakfast sandwich I have every fucking year is that one. And it was absolutely delicious. And my favorite thing was looking over at Verzi after he was two bites in. And I was like, hey, Paul. I go, how's that breakfast sandwich? And he just fucking shot me a look like, are you fucking kidding me? So I was already psyched. And I knew he was going to have a great time. And um, after that, I was like, hey, I'm like, who wants a heater? And everybody's like, yeah, all right. So he poured like fucking eight of them. And I had these, these, those big square ice cubes. I had made those and brought them over in a Ziploc bag, like a fucking, you know, kilo of Coke. So I drop them into everybody's plastic cup. And they're so big, they don't make it all the way down to the bottom of the glass. So the booze is actually below the ice level. And everybody's laughing. I'm like, well, you just got to... F- fucking you got to pour more booze in there and then you put your hand over the ice cube and it'll melt down and that became the technique and then after that it just became like a slideshow just the stuff i remember i remember uh bartnick does this thing every year he gets off to you know gets out of the truck and he just screams at the top of his lungs ladies and gentlemen welcome to the granddaddy of them all and everybody's always terrified, sort of laughing, whatever. So these Iowa fans, somebody just said, oh, we do not need that voice here. And immediately, we're not liking us. And uh, I don't know. I think that for whatever reason, they were really, they were like, I want to say older than me, but I'm pretty fucking old at this point. I'm 47. I think they were in their 50s. And for whatever reason, they were playing Drake. All right. And it was like fucking seven in the morning and their fucking music was louder than our music. So we're sitting there. The sun hasn't even come up yet. And we're listening to you used to call me on your cell phone. You used to. You used to. And it's just was fucking like, oh, God, I think me playing that fucking song. Like that song is like that's like there's a few songs that get played so much that you never need to hear them again. I think the, the original song was in the mood. But I think Benny Goodman, or was it Glenn Miller? I never need to hear that song ever again. Right, I'd say book ending from way back in the day to fucking right now. It goes in the mood, Glenn Miller, and then uh, Cell Phone by Drake. I know when you're not like me. Yeah, they only me one thing. Oh, he's such a bitch in that fucking song. It's basically, hey, I used to just fuck you. I used to. I used to. And then he, she moves away, and then he's upset that the woman got on with her life. You know, what a fucking... He's, is he one of those possessive guys who once he fucks something, he feels like he owns it for the rest of his life? Let it go, dude. All you were doing was fucking her, and now what? Now you want her because she's not there anymore? To come over and lick your balls and shape up your beard afterwards? I mean, fucking move on with your life, Drake. Yo, yo, so, yo, yo, so. So that's fucking going on. And all I know, and they were annoyed with how loud Bartnick yelled. So I don't know what happened. Somewhere between the beer, the shot, and the breakfast sandwich, I glance over and the older guy is chirping in fucking Bartnick's ear. And Bartnick is just staring straight ahead. 600 yard stare, just standing there. And I see the guy talking, talking, talking. And then I just see Joe just shrug his shoulders and be like, well, you know, I don't like your music. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to be honest with you. Fucking 
I don't know what else he said, but 10 minutes later, those people were just gone and we never saw them again. I don't know if they had like some VIP fucking, you know, Iowa Hawkeye fucking barbecue thing, the tent that they were going to. I have no idea, but we were dying laughing. They had one conversation with Joe like the, hey, do you mind keeping it down a little bit? And Joe just gave him the death fucking, you know, the 600 yard stare. And uh, that was it. They just fucking left. So that problem was solved. Then we were throwing the football around. I remembered everything but forgot the bacon. And uh, what's his face? Lawhead was able to call an audible and he had some bison meat or something like that. And, and bacon grease. Figure that one out. I, I don't know how the fuck he did it. But um, yeah, and everything was going great. I was throwing the football around. And then at some point, I was just so fucking hammered that I I fell down. And the, I was one of those drunk falls where it took me like 17. I started falling and it took like 17 seconds for me to fall. And the entire time I was saying, I'm sorry. Uh, it's now known. Yeah, it's now known as <laughs> the I'm sorry fall. And it took me so long to fall that just about everybody at the tailgate saw it. And uh, I think if what I happened was I was standing well, I had had this tent, you know, one of those four posted tent things. I was standing underneath it and unbeknownst to me was right behind me was my cooler and all the other coolers and all the bags of groceries sort of sprinkled out. Right. And I was talking and I did an about face to start walking and immediately tripped over the first cooler. All right. And as I was trying to get my leg to an open area without stepping on hamburger buns, I just you know, there wasn't any space to put my feet down. And I was doing like, it was almost like a wide receiver after they catch a football and they try to stay in bounds and dance down the sidelines. I was doing that, but in between condiments and food and shit like that. And I just, I never regained my balance, but I didn't go down for, I swear to God, if it was probably real time was probably like a four second fall, but that's a long time. You know, if you just fall, bam, you're on the ground you know, in under a second, right? I would think, depending unless you're really short and you get there a little quicker. So I just kept going, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And right as, like, my buddy Nate came over to try and stop me from falling, I just, I fucking landed on my back and I twisted my left knee. And I hear the whole place laughing and I was laughing. Evidently, my last step, I stepped in some avocado and slipped on that. And I just fucking went down, like, just thud right on my back i landed like a wrestler so it didn't even hurt where it was just my entire backside hit the ground at the same time and um i remember talking about it later and i was like yeah but i didn't spill my drink i didn't spill my drink and everybody's like yeah you did you did you spilt it all with the front of your jacket <laughs> so um then i remember getting the, the apple pies out well, i remember the brisket and the ribs being done and those were delicious Law had killing it as always. And then um, I think I smoked a cigar next. Yeah, I smoked a cigar. And then we had the apple pies and everybody freaked out. And they loved them. And then I was, yeah, then I smoked a cigar. And I was like, all right, I got to fucking sober up here because uh, in six hours, the game will be over and we'll be done. And then I got to drive. So, um, oh, fuck. Hang on a second. Hang on. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I had to blow my fucking nose. So anyway, so then we get into the uh, we get into the game, and I still don't know his fucking name because I was hammered. Um, the running back for Stanford just was right as we got into the stadium. He already ran for a touchdown, and then it was just like it was like a fucking Hollywood movie. They couldn't stop this kid. The kid even had another one. He ran like seventy yards for a touchdown. They had to bring it back. They just couldn't fucking get the kid down. Um, and before you knew it, it was like 28 to nothing, 28 to nothing. Then it was 35 to nothing. And we, we still had like half, half of the second quarter that the fucking game was just over. It's, it was the worst Rose Bowl game as far as being competitive that I've been to slash the greatest individual performance I've ever seen. We got to see that kid. He set the record for the most all purpose yards ever in a Rose Bowl. Um, 
And this is the granddaddy of them all. It's the original Rose, uh, original, uh, I guess, bowl game. Um, even though the Yale Bowl is the original bowl stadium. Figure that one out. Anyways. Um, so we got to see that. And fortunately, during halftime, I didn't have to watch the Stanford band. Um, which, by the way, is just, I mean, could you could they be more of a bunch of hipsters? The whole, the whole thing, it's like they're mocking the halftime show, yet not showing how you can improve it. So there's like no risk. You're just sort of mocking the whole fucking thing, like which is to me classic hipster behavior. Uh, to me, that's the difference between nerds and hipsters. You know what I mean? It's like, all right, so you think what? The, the, the standard way that a halftime show is done is too rigid. So you guys are going to... I just hate how the whole thing is done. Oh, these guys are crazy. Oh, look at the guy with the fucking rainbow wig playing the drum. Ooh, what's he going to do? The whole thing is fucking dumb. And then I just thought it was a bad... They made California look bad when they made fun of the Iowa people with the whole... Uh, you know, farmers only. And once again, I don't know. I don't know anybody in the Stanford band, but it just seems like that classic, I live near an ocean, therefore I'm smarter than you. There's something about people who live on the coast with their whole attitude towards the middle of the country. It's the funniest fucking thing ever to me. Like, fly over state and blah, 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 and all that. It's like those fucking people that you're sitting there making fun of, you know? Like, farmers only, hey, why don't you go out there and go fuck your sister? It's like, you, you mean the people who, who grow the food supply for this country, you fucking dope? What are you doing, huh, with your flute? Oh, oh, look at the cool kid with the clarinet. I don't know. I thought it was a hacky joke. And, um, I don't know. You know what I mean? Look, if you guys were, you know, just decided to trash one another, then it would be funny. But it just kind of comes off like, uh, it's like when Ricky Gervais does that shit at the Golden Globes. You know what I mean? He hires a staff of writers to write roast jokes aimed at people who showed up with acceptance speeches. And it's just, oh, gee, did you win that one? What are you going to do next? Slap an ice cream out of a five-year-old hand? I just, I don't know. It's the same thing with that. I thought it was douchey behavior. But fortunately, I missed all of it. You know, and then we come out with a paper mache cow. It'll be epic. Ugh, kill yourselves. It'd be one thing if Stanford ever actually put on a good halftime show. Like, wow, this band is next level. I get why they're trying to break the whole fucking format of it. But if you actually watch uh, the competitions of the best fucking college bands out there, their fucking drum lines alone would destroy anyone in that band. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Every once in a while, I'm a fucking conservative, and I'm a conservative on that one. I just think, yeah, you kind of fucking made an ass of yourself. But anyways, I just hate the deliberately bad dancing that they do. I think if you're going to mock dancing, you should be able to dance well, you know, to just suck at it and then be, like, making fun of it. And then you just fucking, like, all right. Yeah, yeah, just like we thought. Yeah, you don't have any talent. <laughs> <laughs> fuck the stanford band i love their football program though anyways uh so while all of that was going on all that that fucking nauseating hipster behavior uh the looks on their faces like everyone in the crowd is like their mind is blown like oh my god what's going on it's the fuck uh you're in the band <laughs> You're playing the fucking triangle out there. You're not a rebel. You're not freaking anybody out. Uh, so anyways, uh, we actually went out to the concession stand and, um, you know, just standing the, the whole fucking halftime. We're standing this, in this in this line and we actually missed the first three minutes of the uh, the third quarter. And I'm standing in this line. This comedian, Sean Quinn from Philly. He's fucking hilarious, right? So we get all the way up there and uh, I ordered a pretzel and a water and he ordered a pretzel and something else. And uh, I'm fucking coming around. He's still drinking. You know, he doesn't have to drive. So he's still fucking drinking during the game. And they hand him the pretzel and he proceeds after we waited a half an hour for our food. She hands him the pretzel and he fucking just fumbled it. It was like a bad exchange between the quarterback and the running back. You know, they like bump into each other. Or the dude never quite has the ball. He never quite had the pretzel. And it just goes end over end in like slow motion and falls salt side down 
onto the concrete where everybody's standing. He immediately bends down and picks it up. And I'm looking at him, and he just goes, he's like, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. I'm like, dude, you got to give that thing back. And he's like, no, it's all right, it's all right, right? He doesn't give a fuck. So I'm dying laughing like, this guy's a maniac. It's like people walking in and out of restrooms and then coming over here, standing in this food line. Are you out of your fucking mind? But I'm still kind of drunk. So then I go over, we're putting mustard on the pretzel. And then out of nowhere, fucking Lawhead shows up. And he asks... <laughs> He asked Sean for the piece of his pretzel and he gave it to him. I almost fucking fainted. I was laughing so hard. Fucking thing was on the ground. <laughs> I was like, it was like watching him poison him. But I couldn't say anything. I was laughing so fucking hard. So uh, then we get, we finally get back into the, uh, finally get back into the, um, the stadium and then just the whole game just stopped i mean there was barely any scoring iowa came back and scored a couple um i was psyched for verzi because he uh he won two bets he but he bet stanford and then in the next half he bet the over he won both of them so he picked up a buck 50 or something like that and um i don't know then we just ended up going back the game was over and then we went back to uh the truck we were hanging out. We got the bonfire going. The sun was down. And in the middle of having the bonfire, all of a sudden this kid comes walking by with another friend, this Iowa kid. And he just goes, he just goes, hey, he goes, hey, that bonfire is illegal. You can't have it. It's illegal. And right as he was about to be like, go like, ha, 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 I'm just fucking around. The Philly guy. He goes, oh, shut the fuck up, you fucking blah, 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 right? And then the kid fucking puffs up his chest. There's like 10 of us sitting here. This kid was like, uh, he was like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, he comes running up, to, you know, talking all this shit. And I'm just sitting there looking at him like, there's fucking 10 of us here. You know? Do you have an Uzi? Like, what, what are you doing, right? So he gets into it. There's back and forth. The next thing you know, Verzi's over there. And it looks like Verzi's about ready to square off with the guy. Because the guy kept walking away. Be like, all right, all right, whatever, whatever. And he'd be like, all right, fine, fine, fine. But fuck you, because we'd always have the last thing. And then we'd be like, fuck you. And it just kept going back and forth and back and forth. Then finally, the guy's like 30 yards away. Verzi's talking to him. And I thought, like, oh, this kid's going to sucker him. So I got up over there. I'm going, relax, relax, relax. And then all of a sudden, I hear a bottle break. And this fucking maniac, Philly guy, right, fucking breaks the bottle. <laughs> it's the funniest thing ever. He breaks the bottle on the pavement. And he fucking, he did it way too hard. When he brought his hand up, there was no bottle left. He just shattered the fucking thing. But then he, like, mimed like he still had the bottle in his hand. And this is the best part. The Iowa kid talking shit never flinched. <laughs> so now he's pretending he had a bottle in his hand. I didn't even know what he was going to do. It was like a fucking movie. It's like, what the fuck, right? So the dude finally goes away. He has to yell a few more fucking things. And um, it was so ridiculous. Then we went back. And we we were sitting around, and all we did for the rest of the f time there was make fun of Sean and how there was no bottle left. And he actually cut his hand, and we were all just sitting there going like, dude, what were you going to do? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know what I, I always wanted to do that. It was just it was fucking ridiculous. So, um, and by then, you know, actually, as I was coming out of the game, I, I was... I was so sober, I had already got, gotten into the fucking hangover, so I just started drinking waters and um, then had another two hot dogs and a hamburger. And I got to tell you, dude, my body was like, what the fuck? And I just drove home like with a splitting fucking headache, stone sober, splitting fucking headache. And, um, and then by then my knee was killing me. And I was walking like I had just ridden a horse from here to fucking Massachusetts. And I was, I was shot. I came home and I just fucking just pounded like three waters. And that was, it was during that time where I was just thinking to myself, like, I'm never going to that game again. I, I, I fucking, you know, when you're out three to six weeks 
with a fucking knee strain because you went to a tailgate. You really got to start like looking back going like, what the fuck? But it happened to me again this year. You know, every year I go, you know, I'm going to go a little easy. I'm going to go easy. I want to remember as much of this tailgate as I can. Like I passed out for like an hour of it. And part of it was the alcohol, but the other part was just like, I would only gotten three hours sleep. You know, there's only so far you can go. When you start the day off with a Miller. All right, let me, um, but it was one of the, one of the best, uh, one of the best fucking tailgates. And I loved hanging with fucking, uh, all the new people that came along. And I'm now, of course, obsessed with the Philly accent. It's the funniest fucking accent. You got a beard, big asshole. Everything's a John. Um, all right. Hang on a second. All right. Mm. Let me type in my password here so I can do a couple of reads. Come on. I love how they make you pick such a fucking difficult one that, you know, it takes me like three times to type my name because there's some capitals and then there's some not capitals. Like if someone broke into my computer, I don't understand what they would be getting. Um, all right. Okay. Oh, Jesus. I don't even know if I have the fucking energy. It usually takes, it takes me three days to get over the fucking Rose Bowl. This is the third day. All right. Uh, oh, oh, look, we start up. Oh, no, boop. <clears throat> All right. And that's it. Mercifully, that's the last bit of reading I have to do here for the fucking week. Um, all right. And with that, let's get to. Uh, oh, can we talk a little NFL football for us? What? Da, da, da. Boo, doo, boo, doo. I would say the Patriots in Seattle entered the playoffs the exact opposite way. I'm going to go out on a limb. Uh, the Patriots just could not get anything going offensively. Um, our offensive line is just. Uh, it's 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 fucking shattered, dude. We got nobody left. Every time Brady went to pass, there was someone in the backfield. Um, our defense did great, though. I mean, it was holding them to like 10 points for most of the fucking game. But um, hopefully we can get healthy or I don't I don't see us going too deep into the playoffs this year. Seattle on the other ten. I'll tell you right now, this is the wild card team. Nobody wants to play. But you got to ask yourself, are they peaking too early? Seattle looked like world beaters. And the way that they handled the fucking Cardinals yesterday, they made them. I mean, I don't know if the Cardinals started to come back or not. I mean, I watched the first fucking half, and it looked like an NFL team playing a CFL team. Let me check out the final score here. Um, I mean, I think it's just another phenomenal coaching job by Pete Carroll. Um, And he's got, like... He's got him right, oh, 36 to 6. Yeah, they just destroyed him. Scoring at will, doing whatever the, whatever the fuck they wanted. You know, Arizona special teams were looking like shit. Their field goal kicker mixed a couple of extra points. And I don't know what the fuck was going on with them. And they couldn't tackle anybody on punts or kickoffs. The only um, question mark I saw was Seattle. Was their kicker missed another one? And Richard Sherman's hair. That's the only thing I found. That's the second time this year Sherman has been brought down by his hair. Um, to the point they actually thought it was a face mask. He went down so fucking his head went down. Uh, but other than that, uh, I was I was the guy, you know, a couple weeks ago thinking like, you know, Arizona and uh, Carolina. Now I think it's uh, uh, Carolina is would play Seattle at home. But I got to tell you. Seattle doesn't give a fuck. They've been there the last two years in a row. Um, if they win it again this year, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, they, they were one play away for winning it three times in a row. That's absolute bullshit. That's absolute bullshit. Um, you win two in a row. If you win the fucking thing, it changes, it changes your vibe. You know, defending versus bad taste in your mouth. You know what I mean? How long do you think Pete Carroll was able to actually get eight hours sleep after that Super Bowl? Like the drive that he's had to get back because that they fucked that thing up. Slash Malcolm Butler made one of the greatest defensive plays of all time. Like that'll, you know, there's a reason why nobody's ever won three in a row. It's, you know, it's hard to stay that fucking motivated. I think anyways. Um, And I know watching the Patriots win the defending Super Bowl champions versus just being the Patriots, which is bad enough. People want to beat you bad enough. But when you're the defending Super Bowl champion, even the shit teams try hard against you. Um, 
But anyways, having said all that, um, you know, the way Seattle's played over the last month in that last game, like they look like fucking world beaters. Um, so, and us, I don't know if we could beat the Broncos at this point with how fucking injured we are, even with their, uh, their new quarterback. I, that was hard to see Peyton Manning be a backup man, but he took it like a gentleman. Um, I wonder if that was his last game. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. All right, let's get to, uh, let's get to the fucking questions here for this week. Right. And by the way, um, for all the Canadian fans, I'm not ducking the fact that you guys destroyed us in that game. I just haven't seen it yet. I started to watch it yesterday, and after all the fu- the hoopla and all of that shit, I got like a minute and a half in the game, and they already scored. <laughs> I was just like, oh, man. I think the final was 5-1. to one. So congratulations to you cunts. But, um, oh, I got to fix my cooler, too. My cooler took a beating. Both hinges were broken as the interior strap. Thank, thankfully, uh, Igloo makes a repair kit. And I, you know, it's obviously an easy repair. I got to get that fucking taken care of this week. Uh, that, that fucking cooler's been to every Rose Bowl. I got to fix it up here. Who knows? Maybe when I fell, I'm the one who knocked the fucking lid off the thing. All right, breakfast. Here we go. There's no way I did 45 minutes. Jesus Christ, it's flying by. All right, breakfast. Bill, I'm a father. Of two young children, and I hold a nine-to-five corporate job. Don't feel bad for me, though. I love my job. That's awesome. I want you to love your job. And he goes, and I don't bitch about how hard it is to be a parent. Uh, He goes, I maintain a decent diet. I was a college athlete, so I have a basic understanding of the human body. Granted, you and I spend our mornings differently. I freeze my ass off every morning for five to six months of the year. Uh, I was wondering what you do for breakfast every morning. I don't understand. What do you mean you freeze your ass off? What do you do? Uh, you're crazy. I was wondering what you do for breakfast any, every morning. And then he goes on to say, I'm always on the go and I'm not hungry right when I leave for work, uh, which leaves me in the car and at the office for the rest of the morning. Not a lot of options uh, beyond a banana and a coffee. It's too cold for smoothies. What's a man to do? What's your morning food routine? Well, when I'm being smart, I have two eggs over easy, and I have some oatmeal with uh, a banana and maybe some blueberries. I don't have any uh, bread or any of that stuff. And then between breakfast and lunch, I have an apple. And then for lunch, I have turkey slices with the side salad. And then at uh, 4 o'clock, I have a meat with a protein, and 6 o'clock, meat with a protein. And... uh, Meat with the protein? I have a protein with vegetables. Dude, what the fuck? <laughs> My brain is shot here. I have, yeah, I have a protein with some vegetables. <laughs> I have meat with the protein. And then I have uh, bread with some carbs. Um, that's what I end up doing. And then I just, I stop eating around six. Five, six is when I have my last meal. And then I just drink waters after that. If I get really hungry, I just have celery with peanut butter. And I got to get back to that diet because I've been cooking up a fucking storm, bacon and all that type of stuff. Um, And I have three goals this month. I'm going to make a quiche. I'm going to make a fucking lasagna. And I'm going to make this Hunter's Chicken. The last two are Mario Batali recipes. And uh, the Hunter's Chicken isn't that bad. The fucking um, the uh, lasagna is pretty bad, but there's veal in it, and I just can't. I can't get myself to eat lobster or veal. I just, just what the fuck they go through. I mean, I know the chickens and cows already have a bad enough thing, but like it just seems extra fucking cruel. Boiling something alive and and having something just sit in a fucking cage forever, so it's softer and tastes better when you eat. It's just it's fucking brutal. Um. Anyways, all right, so what's my morning routine? Yeah, well, if I was you and I had to, I would eat, I would get up, I would make the time, and I would at least just have some oatmeal. Um, I mean, but I don't have kids. I mean, I just, hearing you guys talking about having kids makes me glad I don't have any. I mean, it just seems so fucking, uh, just never ending, never ending. Um, I don't know. So I will, I will, what do you do for breakfast? All right. I told you what I did the whole day. Um, yeah, if I was, I would, you have to make the time. I would definitely say that you got to make the time. 
And uh, I think the best thing for working out is you do it in the morning and you just get it out of the way. And then you have a healthy breakfast and that gets you on the right track to start the day. To start off the day if you're eating bad and then try to be like, well, don't worry, I'm going to go to the gym later. The problem is with bad food is it chemically fucks your body and it makes you just want to lay down and do nothing. So uh, if you start the day, I don't know. Just do that, that, the tens. Remember I was telling you guys about the tens? Start off was like uh, 10 jumping jacks, 10 burpees, 10 push-ups, 10 alternating lunges, 10 sit-ups. I forget the fucking order. I haven't done it. But you can you can look it up on the internet and find it. And, uh, and you go from 10 and then you do 9 jumping jacks, 9 burpees, 9 push-ups, 9 sit-ups, 9 alternate leg jumps, 9 squat jumps. And then you do eight. You go all the way down to one. And then, you you know, you're pretty much winded. And then if you want to add a little more cardio to it, skip skip rope for a round or two or three or whatever you want to fucking do. Uh, you can do that workout in like a hotel room. Um, but that's what I would do. I would do something like that. And I would just make sure, you know, also if you really don't have time to work out, what will really help you during the day is to bring an apple and to pack a healthy lunch also saves you money. It also gives you more of a lunch hour because you're not driving to and from wherever the fuck you're going. You go right down to the cafeteria, you knock it out, you chill the fuck out, you know? You have something healthy in your afternoon break, and that's the biggest thing, dude. If you're not putting mistakes into your fucking mouth, you're going to get more results from your workout, and you, you know, your clothes will start fitting better. And the same way you get addicted to eating bad, salt, sugar, salt, sugar, you can get addicted to eating well. Uh, which where is not where I'm at right now. Um, all right, one trick pony. Uh, hey, Billy Balls. Uh, my wife loved your pie crust video. Oh, by the way, you know I tried lard in my um, for my crust for the first time, and it was a total game changer. The best crust I ever made. It did feel weird to smell bacon as I was making the pie crust, but. Um, um, uh, thank you to everybody that suggested that who, you know, the, your critique really helped my pie crust. Thank you. Um, all right. So anyways, he, this person says she's a fan of yours as well. She loved the pie crust video. She's a fan of yours as well. And has been exposed to hours of your podcast. She likes you, Bill. Let me lead with that. Well, here comes the big fucking slap in the face. But of course, like all great women, she still has a capacity to chop a man down at the knees. After the video, I casually said, can't wait for the next one. She responded in an oh, sweetie tone with, ha ha, well, how many of these tricks do you think he has up his sleeve? This resulted in a long discussion where I defended your potential skills, and she went with the, I love Bill Burr. I'm just assuming he doesn't have much more to rival this pie crust. Uh, whether you can make a full series out of these videos or not, can you please explain to my wife that you're not a one trick pony? And even if you are a one trick pony, it's bullshit and unfair to assume this much. Uh, thanks. Come back to Wisconsin, home of corruption as seen in documentaries. Um, well, you know something, as you get older as a man, you understand where that's coming from. Why your wife, as you said, like all great women, always have to take you out of the knees. What it is, as much as you got to stop internalizing that and taking it personally, what it is, is that's, it's almost like a subconscious fear thing that they have. You know what I mean? Like when they don't know you and they see you doing something, they have a positive reaction to it going, oh, look, he can make a pie crust. I bet he's going to be a great dad, right? They think shit like that. But after they get with you and then they love you and they don't want to lose you, when they see you continuing to grow as a person, they it's I can't even say this is a female thing. This is like a, a thing in general that people do in relationships is you actually hold back the person you love because you see them expanding on who they are and because it's something new and different and moves in a different direction. I think subconsciously a certain type of person feels insecure. So then they, they have to tether it to the ground with fucking uh, criticism rather than encouraging the person. So I think that that's where it's coming from. But um, as far as addressing it, like... I will just say this as far as my cooking and baking, like 
you don't just know how to make cornflakes and you can also make a pie crust. You know what I mean? Knowing how to make a pie crust takes all of your shit to the next level. Okay? Like, no, like, know this. Because I can do that, like, back in the day, I used to look at, like, making, like, a quiche or something like that, going, oh, my God, that's fucking impossible, the crust alone. Or making a turkey pot pie or anything that involves having a crust. Um, you can add that. I recently have learned how to smoke meat. You know, I smoke ribs. Uh, I can make all of my, my, my mother before we, when we all moved out, she wrote out all of her recipes, hand wrote them all out on cards and we have all of them and we can all cook the meals that she made when we were growing up. Like I can make you Hungarian goulash. And you know what else? I can make the fucking noodles from scratch. I took a pasta making class. You know, as you suspected, sir, your wife has no idea what the fuck she's talking about. What it really was, it was coming from a place of insecurity and jealousy. And right now she's going to roll her eyes and be like, oh, my God, blah, 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 blah. It's fucking true. You know, because that's really just like a just like to have like that, that, oh, sweetie tone. You know how they do that shit. You know, you go out, you start looking a little too good. You get a new new suit, right? You're looking a little. They got to fucking. They got to got to make a comment. They they fucking do it with each other. It's hilarious. I think that's one of the main reasons that's fucking them up. By the way, you know when they always talk about the wage gap and all that. One of the biggest problems with the wage gap is not men. It's the fact that women don't get together and create businesses enough. They just don't do it because they're too busy going, look at this bitch and fucking look at her. With the, she's too fucking skinny. She needs to eat something. She's got on too much fuck. Oh, she knows what she's doing. You know, they don't work well together. I don't know why, but that's not our fault. I'm sure it is, though. If you watch the view, I'm sure they could spin it around to us. So, um, yes, sir. I actually absolutely love cooking and um, it isn't the only trick I have up my sleeve. Um, I could obviously make more of those, but the thing about it was, was that was a specific skill. It was for the holidays and people have suggested, well, why don't you do one on how to smoke meat? Or why don't you do one about making pasta from scratch? My thing is because you could watch Mario Batali do it. You can watch champion smokers do it. So I guess what makes mine different is that I make it funny. You know, I just looked at it as a, a one fucking random thing that I was going to do. But, you know, now that she's been a douche about it, you know what? I'll make another one at some point, I guess. Um, I'll Let's see. What the fuck will I do? The turkey pot pie on the big green egg. I mean, I've watched YouTube videos of all of those. I just didn't really saw somebody do like a... Is there a pie crust video? I don't know. I just thought it'd be fun. I literally feel like I'm in a relationship right now. I'm sorry that that video annoyed you. <laughs> oh, God, they're so fucking moody. Uh, yeah, I will I will figure out something else um, to make one of those. I'll do like one a year. No, it's actually giving me some ideas. Like maybe I'll do one. Oh, the summer's coming. All right, you're going to show up the 4th of July. Is a quick fucking thing you can make. You know, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it. I just don't like committing to shit like that. I love not having a job, which is why I'm a fucking comedian. I, I really enjoy this whole I work when I want to rather than being, okay, we need 20 episodes of this. All right, Thursday afternoon podcast got me laid, Bill. Oh, something positive. Oh, John, do you really think you could get somebody else laid? It's a fucking disease. Um, <laughs> it's probably why we die eight years earlier, just because they just won't give it up. But if you get yourself out in front of it, Next time your wife does that to you, sir, next time she takes you out at the knees, just come up to her and stroke the side of her face. You know, when you go out and get a new car and you oh, honey, don't you think you're a little bit old for that car? You know, does one of those things, makes you feel stupid, right? Just walk up, stroke the side of her face. Just go, oh, sweetie, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you. <laughs> it's okay. Shh. It's okay. I know I look good in the car. I'm sorry. Something like that. Something creepy. All right, Bill, last week on New Year's Eve, my wife and I listened to your podcast after we put the kids to bed. We drank wine and laughed our asses off. That's great. This woke us up, energized us. Just as the throwback clip came on, it appeared that we may 
have sex to ring in the new year. Well, boy, oh boy, not more than a few notes into the outro song, we were going at it. It was all over just moments after the song ended, so maybe four minutes or so of ball-dropping bliss. My dick thanks you for the laughs and the soundtrack. Did you guys fuck to the Me Undy song? I don't think I needed to know that. Um, all right. Oh, here it is. Here it is. This is the one I wanted to read. This is this is amazing. Overpopulation myth. Bill, how you're doing? And I'm just checking in on you. Uh, to inform you that if you go online and see for yourself how much arable, A-R-A-B-L-E, farmland and resources there actually is in the world, you'll see that there is enough to feed and home at least 100 billion people for a provable fact. I don't know. That sentence didn't make sense. Did you like voice text this? Or did you actually, this is how you actually type out sentences. Person goes, so anytime you hear anyone say that 7 billion people is too many people, um, they're, T-H-E-I-R, either seriously misinformed and or too lazy to do some research or flat out lying through their teeth like our so-called leaders and scientists must be. Oh, yeah, they got to be lying because you not you can't even spell their right. Because within one to do two days of research, you can find studies that prove what I say. It's going to take me one to two days to find it on the Internet. <laughs> this is fucking hilarious. One to, days, one to two days to research, you can find studies that prove what I say is true. Parentheses, at least 100 billion. Now, I know you're in the business of waking the masses up, just like the late great Bill Hicks. No, I'm not. But do you realize how serious the situation is regarding the distraction and brainwashing as organized by big business and their controlling family owners? So as great as I think you and your comedy are, mentioning overpopulation, which is a complete myth, is doing them, parentheses, big corporations and the cunts who own them, a big service in adding to the brainwashing. Anyway, Bill, I know you're a great man because of the subjects you talk about during your shows, but please look for yourself at how much admirable, admirable farmland there is and, and consider the fact that all food grows completely for free. Um... Wow. All right. Well, I'll tell you this, buddy. I know I'm a moron, so I just looked up. I looked at this. How many people can the earth sustain? Um, and it says, uh, how many people can the earth support? So 10 billion people is the utmost population limit where food is concerned. That's the first one. The next one says more than 7 billion people currently are on the planet compared to 3 billion in 1967. That one doesn't say. I'll, I'll just... Well, that's a video. I don't want to watch that. Current population is three times the sustainable level. That's uh, the next article. Um, how many people can the Earth sustain? I'll click on this one. I'm trying to find anything that says anything even remotely close to 100, million, 100 billion. Here's a staggering stat. According to the United Nations, the world's current population is 7.2 billion. It's now up to 7.8. It's projected to increase by 1 billion over the next 12 years, which would bring us to 9.6 billion by 2050. How can we sustain all these people on the planet? Or rather, how many people can this planet sustain? That is the question Alan Weissman explored in his latest book, Countdown, Our Last Best Hope for a Future on Earth? Question mark. Uh, Jesus Christ, a bunch of conversations bunch of words how about a number where is the fucking number all right he has the chart oh, well, if it's gonna in the next 50 years we will need to produce as much food as has ever been consumed for an entire human history well that makes sense because there'll be the most people there'll be the most farts ever in, in the history of human beings I, well there's no fucking number there sir all i can tell you is is if you see the environmental damage that 7.8 billion people did, if you're going to have 100 billion people, like, I mean, at this point in Africa, there's barely any land for, for wild animals. 
it's all it's all like for the most part down in the southern part of, of the country uh it's all like roped off it's finite you know what i mean they're completely surrounded i'd have to say that i disagree and not just by your spelling because i couldn't read half the fucking words you said even when you spelt them right but yeah no there's no fucking way 100 billion people and there's any sort of animal life left that isn't stuck in a cage you know what i mean um and also in this last year i traveled to singapore hong kong and mumbai india and i saw what that next level of population looked like dude and i was breathing that air not singapore singapore was was different um but hong kong and mumbai india you could almost taste the fucking air and it was just uh it was just way too many fucking people. I can I can tell you that. There's no way 100 billion people. Um, and I don't understand why I need to look it up for one to two days. Why couldn't you just send me a link? I would love for you to be right, but uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say you're not. Uh, I'm going to go with the scientists on this one. And also, this also sounds like, you know, when people denied global warming. Not to get all political, but one political party adamantly denied it for years and years and years and now they've decades and now they finally just go yeah we are causing climate change but you know what it's too late now so i imagine that that's what we're going to do out here we have a fucking methane gas leak that's been going on and i guess that's probably it's like 10 times worse than carbon dioxide as far as getting put into the fucking uh atmosphere as far as heating it up and all that we're completely fucked we're fucked we're absolutely fucked um and selfishly, I hope I, it doesn't happen by the end of my own life, which is the exact sort of thought process that got us into this mess to begin with. But, sir, you're, you're correct in assuming that I'm a fucking dope and I don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, I'm just kind of going with having traveled extensively, you know, for the last 20 years on the road and watching the population increase just in this country. Um. It's a weird thing where the population it keeps looking like it's sort of leveled off. And I don't know if because there's no factories anymore. All I know is like I've, I it used to be back in the day. If I jumped on the highway at two in the afternoon, I was good. And now everywhere I go, there's like traffic. And I'm just looking at these people going like, are you guys all stand up comics? Does everybody work the third shift? How the fuck are all these people out on the road? I don't even know what's going on. Do a lot of people work from home and they're all driving out to get a sandwich at that time? I don't know. You know what? Let me look up. I heard the U.S. population has kind of leveled off, which has excited me. That's exciting to me, you know? U.S. population. Oh, Jesus Christ, Bill. Can you fucking population by year? Let's do this. All right. Let's see what we got here. U.S. population by year. All right. Let's go back. To 1997, there was 2.7265 million, and now there's 322.07 million. So it's gone up by like 50 million. Is that enough to notice? Well, that's actually, you know, that's significant, right? That's like a 20% increase. I think I'm making some points. <laughs> All right, let's move on here. All right, uh, advice changing high schools. Dear Bill, I'm a freshman in high school and would like to know your perspective on my situation. I currently attended a performing arts high school and majored in jazz studies. Oh, that's fucking cool. I enjoy it and all, but this uh, the first semester has passed. I found out that jazz is something I don't want to do in life. Rather than carry on for, with the next three years of this major, I'd rather change schools and major in something that would benefit me in the long run, especially if I want to attend big schools like Harvard. Uh, well, that's good, man. You tried something. You, you've, you've realized early on you don't like it, and you got enough strength to be like I, I, to communicate it. I don't want to do this, and you'll need something else. It's all good so far. Uh, the problem is that in leaving my current school, I could possibly devastate the bands I'm in. Oh, Jesus, there came an ego out of nowhere, and also hurt some friends. My director has placed me in some good bands, and I even get paid money for playing gigs. Oh, so you're crushing it. I would feel terrible to leave my director as he has put me in a position 
that many others would gladly take. This question has been tearing me apart for a while. What do you think, Bill? Should I stay or should I go? Also, if I do decide to leave, do you think I should tell my friends and directors that I that I am, or should I just go out quietly? Um, dude, you have to do in life if what makes you happy. If you try to make other people happy, that's all you're going to do, and you're not going to be happy, and then you're going to be miserable to be around. You're going to turn into a bitter person who didn't do what they wanted to do in life, and no one wants to be around that guy, all right? So as much as it's going to hurt them, uh, you got to leave, and you got to tell them, and you have to tell them why you're going to leave and just say, listen, I'm just not happy doing this. I understand that I'm lucky and that a lot of people would kill to be in my position, so I feel that someone should at least be happy and be excited. You know, if people desire to be in my position and I'm occupying that position and I'm not happy, I'm doing an injustice to myself and one of you guys. All right? I apologize. I'm sorry. And then that's it. And you know what? It's a great life lesson. Sometimes, you know, when you ask for what you want, people get hurt. And, uh, you know, I don't mean you physically have to hurt them. You, you know, their bottom lip quivers a little bit. That's all I'm saying. Um, that's it. But don't go out quietly. Don't sneak out the back door. Be a man or woman about it and fucking, you know, be an adult. All right. That's it. And you should be commended for understanding that you don't like something and, and not just staying in it. All right. Book recommendations. All right. Hey, Bill, um, not to start off by blowing smoke up your ass, but F, 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 is for family is a phenomenal show has me cracking up nonstop. but i digress well thank you i appreciate that it gives me a chance to promote the show uh if you haven't watched it yet please check out f is for family evidently we're doing great on the old netflix there uh this person says i remember you mentioned you read open oh that you read open by andre agassi so i picked it up and started reading it it truly is one of the books that's tough to put down. Was wondering if you had any other recommendations that you've read of late. Thanks and go fuck yourself. Uh, that comedian book that I mentioned, um, I have it downstairs. Uh, it's like the history of uh, stand-up comedy. Let me look it up here. Um, which has taken me forever to get through because every time they bring up a name, I'm like, who the fuck is that guy? And then I look him up and then I'm on the internet. But it's been a, it's been a joy. The history of stand-up. Comedy book. There it is. All right. This is what I've been reading. It's called The Comedians. Uh, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy. Jesus Christ. How about brilliance? Do you know any geniuses in there? No, not, no nod to Pryor? Lenny Bruce? None of that? All right. Um, yeah. So I would. That, that's what I've been reading. And... Uh, I don't know. I'm in another one of those modes where I'm just playing a lot of drums and I'm, I'm cooking and that type of stuff. And uh, also feeling the pressure to put out another cooking video to shut up somebody that I never met before. How fucking ridiculous is that? Um, I should just let it go. You know, I should. But you know what? I'm not gonna. You know what? Maybe I'll make a fuck. I'll make a breakfast one. I made a pie one. I'll make a breakfast one. I'll make a lunch one. I'll make a dinner or a supper one. I'll do it all throughout the fucking years. All right, that'll be all. Basic cooking by a basic cunt. All right, that's the podcast for this week. Go fuck yourselves. I'll check in on you on Thursday. Um, it's a brand new year. I have like two stand-up gigs booked because I'm trying to figure out what the fuck is going to go on with this show. If we're going to get a second season, I, I need to know. But uh, I think I'm just going to start booking shit because um, that's how this business works. You know, if you... Uh, if you book a bunch of shit, then they just go, oh, well, let's fucking give you something right in the middle of all that other shit that you booked. If you don't book anything, then you're just going to be staring at your phone and it's never going to ring. What are you, fucking a witch, Bill? You're into, you're into superstitious stuff? Well, maybe I am. I have no idea. But uh, Paul Verzi is going to try to not drink starting today until the beginning of April. And I told him that I w I'm sort of half-ass committed that I would do it with him. Um... So I'm sort of on the wagon right now. I didn't drink last night. I don't really have any desire to do it today. I'm fucking wiped out. So we'll see. I'm going to try to see. I'll, I'll try to go as long as I can. Um, all right, that's it. Go fuck yourself. So I'll talk to you on Thursday. What's up, everybody? And welcome back to the Anything Better podcast, NFL edition for week 
18, the final week of the regular season is upon us. And uh, we got a great last show for you guys. Last picks. Uh, but don't worry, the playoffs are coming. By the way, before we get into this, I don't know if you guys remember. I I beat the book last year and Paulie shit the bed in the playoffs. I was like one and seven and the rest of the show carried me. So I want to bring this winning streak into the playoffs because, oh, Paulie had a rough one last year. <laughs> but we got one more. Week. I know, but you beat the book three years in a row. That I did. And it was not a pile on team. It wasn't a pile you on You didn't team. need Kobe, Shaq, Phil Jackson, Kevin Garnett, fucking KD. It was no. Paul. Paul alone. He did not take his talents to South Beach. He nope. stayed right there in New York. You know, he wore a different hoodie for 18 weeks in a row. The man is not superstitious. He he yeah. beats the book. And you Paul know what? Verzi. You, and you know what, Bill? Death I taxes in- and Paul Verzi beating the book. It's fucking amazing, Paul. I was in uh, I was in um, uh, Los Angeles in my hotel. Week three, I went 0 and 4. I was like six game under. I was licking my wounds. I was licking my wounds. But you know what? Just picture you with your head between your knees. Ah, oh, yeah, this isn't me, man. <laughs> oh, Bill. By the way, I'm you gonna are, jump. You, uh, I think you, me, and I don't know what Themless did, but we both went three and one. You and I, Themless. You, you and do? I must go three and you one. And I need to go seven and zero oh this week off of four games to somehow break <laughs> be five hundred. I accidentally on the chart picked five games, but I, I won the first four. And then I noticed that I told you guys, if whatever happens, I'll just, I'll take one win off. So I'll, I went three, three, I'll give it three and one. All right. So, the- okay. So basically us three collectively went nine and three. Um, but let's get into the sponsor before uh, we get into this, guys. You guys know what it is. It is the great Bet MGM, the best lines out there, the best live lines out there. If you haven't signed up yet, get uh, you get fifteen hundred dollars. Get your shit together. Your first bet offer. It's How week eighteen. It, it is four easy steps. You download the Bet MGM app. You sign up using the bonus code for our show, the Anything Better Show, which is Burr. Could not be easier. B U R R, and you are in. All right, all you got to do is put at least $10 into the BetMGM Sportsbook account, place your first wager, and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. If the bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Bet responsibly. Have fun. Let's get into week 18. Oh, 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 oh. I gotta do it. You, I got to tell you guys something. Bill, you're going to love this. Uh, I wanted to uh, send this to you. <clears throat> But I couldn't yesterday. But check this out. So, unfortunately, my back has been really bad. I have a disc issue, issue, and I'm going to get some x-rays tomorrow and everything. So, I couldn't go to my son's basketball game yesterday, which was home. But they have a thing where you could actually watch it with the link they send you. So, I'm laying in bed, and I'm on my phone, and they, they do it. They actually do a good job. They scan the thing. I see my daughter sitting down in the bleachers. I hear my wife talking, like, right? Dude, they're playing this team Westlake. Which can you press a button and like yell at the ref from your house? Dude, I wanted the to. The fuck was that? Dude, I wanted to. No, I wanted to press a button and yell like, "Guys, hands up!" Thief. It was like I'm laying there watching it, right? So anyway, they're, <laughs> they're playing. I, I wanted to, out another disc. Oh, dude. So um, they're playing a team that's superior to them. They're playing a team that they played already this year and lost by 24. So Jesus. Lucas. Lucas had a couple of buddies over around New Year's and he's going, dad, we're going to be closer. We're going to play them closer. Long story short, I'm watching this thing. It was like a movie when the injured players at a hospital bed jumping around. Dude, I am. I'm watching this. Let's win, let's win this one for my dad. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's like a two or three point game. Then they start pulling away. They get up six in the fourth. Lucas hits a three. Then they hit another one, and then we're five. It's a five-point game with like a minute something left. They're right? up or down? What? We're down. Uh, so Lucas, so Lucas, um, he gets a steal with like, like two minutes left, runs down. It's just him and the kid. I'm laying in bed. He goes up, and one goes in. The place goes nuts. What are he you won- doing? He, oh, dude, I leaned up and I went, ah! <laughs> I, 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 
<laughs> and I told I told Stacy, I go, Stacy, I just cheered and hurt myself. I go, ah, yeah, right. No, you went, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it hurts. It hurts. So that'd so, be a uh, great scene in a movie, dude. So he's fucking he, hilarious. Oh, uh, so he goes to the foul line, just w- swishes the foul shot. They come down, dude. They 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 score again. Then he hits a three, dude. And and now it's like a two-point game. And they get fouled. And they go to the line and miss both. And we don't get the rebound. And oh. Lucas is, and, and everyone's going like this. Box them out. That, that's what they're screaming. You got to box out. So we foul them again. They go to the line, hit one. Now it's a three-point game. They call timeout and they design a play for Lucas to, to shoot a, a three. Oh, my God. And dude, he comes up and he was really far out. He was really far out. And Steph he, Curry. And he jumped too high and it rattles in and out, dude. And then there's a there's 0.7 seconds left. We got the ball because they tipped it out of bounds and we threw it in and we lose it to buzzer. And <sighs> he comes home. We would have never been in the game if it wasn't for him. He comes home and I knew what it was going to be. And he walks up the stairs and I go, hey, buddy, I saw every second of that game. Great game. And he just looks at me and looks away. He doesn't say nothing. And then Stacy goes, did you hear your father? And he just keeps walking. And I hear his door close. And uh, I go in his room and I'm like, hey, man, he's just got his head down. He goes, do you have a walker? He goes, can you please leave? <laughs> he goes, can you, can you please leave right now? And I just tapped him on the leg. I go, buddy. I go, dude. Those shots, I go, you led, you know, would you lead all scorers? That steal you had, that you're not even in the game if you don't do that. You're not even in the game, you know? And he's just like, Dad, can you just please? So I let him have his thing. And then he came out and he's talking and he's like, he's like, yeah, I just, uh, I just texted the coach and I said, don't think I don't want that shot every time or something. And then he just looked at me. He has a game today and he goes, I can't fucking wait to play again. And I was just like, there it is, dude. There it is. I go, you're going to have a lot of those, but uh, I got it. I got some video for you to see, dude. It's nuts, man. It's not. Yeah. yeah dude, so, he's got the mentality. He's got the shot. That's amazing. No, dude, it was, it was nuts. And I was like, yeah, if, if, dude, but I'm, it's almost better that the, <laughs> if that shot went in, I would have fell off the bed and been flopping around like a fucking fish. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was amazing dude like he's gonna win games for that team like he's just like coming into his own so and uh, also you know what it is too it's like it's incredible uh life experience the ups and downs and then the stories you have and then that bond you have with your friends that you know yeah, I got friends of mine, Duke, that, that like there's, there's still towns they drive through and they get like this feeling because they lost a game there. You know, I didn't play organized sports. My parents thought I was, you know, I would do I wouldn't do as well in school. So they pulled me out of organized sports in uh, the fifth grade because I got a D in math. And then I proceeded to flunk everything anyway. <laughs> they took away the one thing I would have been halfway decent with. But, you know. They were academias. I, I couldn't imagine. Somebody said, like, imagine these parents that have multiple children in the pros and they go and they see them compete against each other. And one's on the fucking Jets and one's on the you know Niners. And it's like, I'm watching my son play a team like in high school, far superior. And I'm watching him bring the gymnasium to life and make it a game because of his shooting. And it was, dude, I was fucking. Dude, How about was, the parents, the amount of hours? Yeah. If your kid makes it all the way to that level, all the way to the NFL, the amount of hours that you invested driving them to practice, going to all the games, it's unreal. Like, and dude, they, and you know what's nuts is watching them double team him and hearing another coach going like, don't let him shoot. I'm just like, it's the great dude. Dude, there's like three guys on him when he's pulling up. <laughs> the fucking best. Um, all right. <clears throat> Bill, it is week 18. It is week 18. We both went three and one last week. I believe it's my pick first. And I am going to go. I don't even fucking care. (laughs) Um, No. Playing with house money here, Paul. Yeah, but we like to close strong, no? I want to close strong. So we we, we build some sort of winning tradition here. I'm fucking, I'm in a hot seat, Paul. Last two years, I haven't beat the book. And here come the excuses. Go, going into this week, just so people know the records, Bill, you're 30, 31, and 4. 
What? And I'm only a game down. Yeah, dude, you went three and one, two and two. Yeah, you're thirty. To, I'm. I'll re add everything up. Oh, it's but, all right. Well, shit. Then, <laughs> uh, Paul, I gotta you're, make this work, man. Paul, you're thirty six, twenty five, and three. That's a big fuck you to the book. What do you got, Andrew? And, well, despite the fact I didn't actually make any money gambling this year, uh, I did pretty well in this particular area. Uh, 41, 19, and 5. What? Wow. Why aren't you hosting this show? Because <laughs> it's a fluke, Bill. It's well, why fluke. don't you put money on the games that you're fucking betting at some point during the season? I, I don't like individual uh, you know games. What it is? You, you, just, you, you got too much uh, shucks in you. All right. That's my one fucking thing about you, Andrew. You, you're too what? goddamn modest. <laughs> Andrew's silent and then Jake the snake just fucking lay it in the weeds every week just fucking with this fucking like like a like a fucking snake paw <laughs> just hitting the book and the book has to take a nap like a mongoose all right let's let's fucking do this Paul all right, my first pick, I am going to take a team that just needs to win, and they're in, and they're at home, and that is the Green Bay Packers minus three against the Bears. If the Packers win, they make the playoffs. They won last week, and um, I think they're going to – I think even though the Bears are playing well, I think the Packers find a way to get into the playoffs. I'm going to take Green Bay at home. All right, I like the uh, Cleveland Browns getting seven over the Bengals at home. Oof. It's I don't cool. know if there's somebody hurt. I don't give a fuck. I like the Browns defense, and I like getting seven. And I like coffee. And I like having eggs. I like lamp. Uh, why are the Kansas City ch – oh, because they clinched. Got it. Never mind. They clinched. See, this is the week. This is a weird week. That's stupid. They should fucking play. They should go out and bury the Chargers. Make them think about moving back to San Diego. That's what they should be doing. I'm going to take the Jacksonville Jaguars minus. You love the Jags. I do. Minus, I love that pick. Minus five and a half versus the Texans, who I think. The Titans. I mean, the Titans, which I think Mike Vrabel's going to get. I think they're going to can him. I got a feeling. And I got to tell you something, Paul. That's a great coach to pick up. Yeah, he's good. He's really good. He did good. great things there, Paul. You know, he they didn't have all the money. They didn't have all the guys. That guy's a winner. I Ooh, like Mike Vrabel. It'll be a rough Black Monday for Mikey. <laughs> no, he, that guy's definitely going to work again. Hey, Dude, Mike. The amount of guys, the amount of fucking chances some guy, I'm not going to say the names, Paul, but Bill, the amount of guys Bill, that just keep fun? getting chance after chance. Look at college football. Lane Kiffin. And now he finally lands in Mississippi. He's doing great things. Oh, He's doing God. great things. I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something. Somebody just said the Raiders should pick up Vrabel. Perfect fit. I would stick with the guy they have. Yeah, for some reason they're saying they might not, which is weird. Um, oh, Bill, gee, Paul, you... throw, a, throw a guess out. Throw a guess in there. No, no, Bill, they weren't. They had Art Shell. They had the first black coach. Yeah, they Head did. coach. They did. Um, what do you think of coaches doing with their wives after the last Sunday? Honey, don't answer the phone. <laughs> yeah. And then they go, Maybe that's great. Just, Let's do a little stay vacation. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, you know what, sweetie? They want to just maybe say good job. See you next year. Nah, give me my box. Bring that empty box. <laughs> Karen, pack up. We're moving. Where? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we should have gone for two. <laughs> you can't make me laugh. Oh, oh you're back. Sorry. Uh, Although that is tempting to keep making you laugh. Oh, that's funny. We should have went for two. I knew we should have picked up that kicker. He always is left. The kicker um, always gets left. Go ahead. What do you all got? Right, the Lions got fucked last week. They need to win. They need to go in positive. They don't need to win. But are, this, are these guys all going to push out the last week and rest their starters? Um, is that what they're all going to do? These are all division rivalry games. The NFL's setting it up for exciting games. And they, Patrick Mahomes is going to sit out this week. Is that why he's only going to play a half? Boy, look, what's going on here? Yeah, they'll probably, like, play halves. So stupid. All right, whatever. I, You know, I don't give all I, Paul, all I can go with is what I know. I like the Lions minus three and a half versus the Minnesota Vikings. Um, I like that. I like that. I like that. What's that, coaches? Dan Campbell? Yep. I like that guy. 
I was saying on my podcast, he was like when he just kept going for two against the Cowboys. He was like Joe Pesci when he was playing blackjack in casino. <laughs> hey, take that ineligible and shove it up your mother's ass. <laughs> He just keeps going. He was on that 0-16 team poll. He's like, not again, motherfucker. I like this guy. Players coach. I like him, and I like the – what's the guy in the Raiders' name? Antonio Pierce. Antonio Pierce. Those guys look like football guys. They look. They don't look like analytic guys. Run it down their fucking throats, Paul. How I like these smile? guys. How can you smile? Um. All right. Here we go. 49ers and Rams. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling 49ers. I don't know, dude. We're going to sit Purdy and we're going to sit somebody else. And then the Rams are going to win by two. No, they're at the 49ers? (laughs) You ever see that stadium, Paul? It looks like a fucking roller coaster when you're walking up to it. I'm going to take Oh, when the Saints... Come marching, go marching in. in. Oh, when, oh, the, when Saints the Saints go, go marching, marching in. It beat the Falcons by more than fucking three. Um, Paul Versey's back's going to feel much better. I think the Saints are going to win that game by three because I believe they have a shot. They might need help, but if they win, they got a shot. So I'm going to take the Saints at home minus three against the division rival. You know what be hilarious is if the Saints release Derek Carr and the Patriots pick him up. So we all go, dude, fucking Derek Carr. <laughs> I'm going to take the Commanders plus 13 versus the Cowboys. That's a great bet. That's Division great. rivalry. Evidently, everybody's going to sit down this week to pee, you know, going into the fucking playoffs. All right. I'll do that. And four, my fourth and final pick of this season. My last pick of this year's thing i'm gonna finish off with my new york giants getting four and a half in philadelphia what is going on in philly paul philadelphia is reeling they just lost to the cardinals and i know the giants are going to try to give them a little fuck you before it's over not saying the giants win the game it had to be it had to be injuries paul what happened to them i don't know but i like the four and a half i like the four and a half so oh paulie cutlets Oh, Polly Pasta. He's uh, sticking with his paisan over no, there. He's benched. They benched. Tommy's been benched. Oh. Tommy got benched two weeks ago. <laughs> I'll tell you something. There is no city in the sport world that can get you fucking excited about someone that's going to be on the bench two fucking weeks later or traded. 100%. Never seen anything like it. Mark Sanchez. I mean, they started Tommy blind. Cutlets. They're making a who was the Asian kid just exactly. killing everybody on the Knicks? Who was that kid? Uh, Jeremy Lin. Oh my God! Why did you trade that guy? He was uh, a New York City legend, and then the guy ah, we're going to trade you to Houston. Who'd you Who'd you get for him? Uh, dude, I don't even know. We just fucking Craig shit. Gatlin, Chris Gatlin. Who'd you I get for him? I don't know who the fuck we got. Uh, uh, well, you have a fourth pick. I do have a fourth pick, Paul, and I'm taking the Chicago Bears. I'm going against you, Paul. You know oh, I love you. All right. You know, you know I love you. And I, you know I love Jordan Love. <laughs> you know, that fucking kid's got that arm, dude. I, I, lo- I love the Packers, but it's just they're eight and eight. The Bears are coming on. I don't know. It's a these fucking teams. Yeah. They played each other a zillion times. I'm starting to believe in that Ohio State kid on the Bears. I think everybody just shut the fuck up and they're just letting them sling it. And I like what they're doing over there, Paul. And uh, I'm a stand-up comedian, so what the fuck do I know? There you go. That completes. Paul, I swear to God. I need, I can't, I cannot go two and two. I have to go three and one. Paul, I need this one. (laughs) (laughs) Let's get all desperate, Paul. You don't understand. Dude, you were, you, I've never seen a guy say they weren't doing, you were like two and two every week this year. Um, well, the level that I had to leave my fucking house watching the Cowboys piss that fucking game away to the Lions. That was the story. Not that this fucking guy checked in, Paul. It was that they were up by seven and the Lions had only scored 13 points the whole game. And all of a sudden, they, first of all, they should have run the ball three times before they kicked a field goal. They threw it one time. I get it. They went for the fucking kill shot. But you missed that thing. You you saved yeah. 30 seconds. You just gave them a fucking timeout. They yeah. run the ball on third down. They line up. They kick the fucking ball. Then they go into this soft zone 15-yard 
prevent. Dude, they just show their bellies. Dude, it's 10 yards for a first down. Now, I'm an old guy. I don't remember. Does the, does the clock stop on a first down inside of two minutes? I think it does. It, it does. It so stopped. you're giving them timeout, timeout, timeout. Yeah. 25 yards, 10 yards, 14 yards. Paul, yeah. you want to know why I don't have any fucking hair? <laughs> it's the prevent well, defense. Dude, I got it. No, but you know something? I think, dude, Mike McCarthy, that coach, that's why they hated him in the Packers. Do you know how many games they were winning late in playoff games and then all of a sudden they just fucking play scared? The Cowboys fucking sucked at the end of that game. They, they didn't suck. The the, the, the the fucking idea to, to do that soft zone sucks. Yeah. I want to see the analytics on that, Paul. Like how many times – does it actually run out the clock? Because all know, I think it, all I think I think it does is it guarantees an exciting ending for football fans, and that they're, the other team that's down is going to get four shots at the end zone. Yeah, but you notice that the 49ers don't do that. Some of those these really good teams don't. Alabama play well. Crimson Tide does not do that. If you watch that Auburn game, when Auburn fucking pulled their pants down and bent over the fucking goddamn couch, rushing two. And the fucking yeah. guys just standing back there. Granted, it was an incredible throw. Incredible throw. But they score the touchdown. The very next one, they got him pinned down on the two-yard line. Are they giving him a 15-yard cushion? Saban's got him up on the fucking line. Yeah. Playing football, Paul. You play to win the game. You know why? Because the defensive coach are going, no one's beating us deep. That's what happens, dude. On a two-minute drive, they go, nobody's beating us deep. Get back. Get back. It's, they haven't it's, beat you deep all day. At what point are you going to believe that the first 58 minutes were true? Exactly right. That's why, you know what? Me and you should just quit comp. Let's just coach a team. Me and you. I'll be your D coordinator. You this is us at the end of the season. I have a newfound respect for coaching. Uh, there was a lot of things I didn't take into consideration when I was sitting on my couch. Uh, <laughs> there has club, to be a reason, Paul. What about Club Soda Kenny? Being a coach, you're out. <laughs> yeah. Dude, coach, I'll take, do? Kenny doesn't playing. give a fuck about sports. He's been to a bunch of sporting events with me. And when he goes, he's immediately breaking down the game. Yeah. He goes, why do they keep running that play? I was like, this guy's like paying attention. He can't shut it off, Paul. Yeah, he's yeah. immediately, he just like, he's like a fucking security camera. Just looking at the offense and defensive side. Why do they, why do they keep doing this? He shouldn't be single covered. Mister, double him. <laughs> Are they going to cover that guy? How many buckets is he going to score? And you're just looking at him like, and I go like, look at you. And then he just laughs. I go, but you still don't give a fuck. He's like, no. <laughs> I'll tell you, Paul, I don't miss being on the road because I love my children and my wife so much, I fucking love being home. But I, the only thing that sucks about being home is a fucking club soda Kenny. Right I don't now. get to see him as much, dude. I know. he's a Dude, that, that guy, heart of gold, loyal as they come. Yeah. He's 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 the greatest, Paul. Like, that's one of those guys. When he fucking retires, there's, there, you, you don't replace him. No. You just tell the stories. And I love that when we were at the Masters with him, he was so psyched to see Tiger when we were psyched. He was like, there he is. Like, he knew. Like, he yeah. knows. You know, he loved it. He loved yeah. it. You know what um, he's into on the road? What? Presidential libraries. Uh, <laughs> he gets into the Secret Service and shit. So we were supposed to start hitting those things. Uh, um, dude, the two funniest presidential libraries ever is going to have to be Trump and Biden. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like the Trump one should be like part amusement park because he's so fucking if he's not running the country, the guy is fucking hilarious. Uh, um, and then Joe Biden, I don't know what it is. You, you know what it should be? You, you, they don't really build it. You Google, Google Maps can't find it or something or like it's something. There's something about like, I don't remember. Jake, Jake just wrote George W. Bush is very funny. There's a whole wing of him throwing out the first pitch. By the way, I didn't know that Jeter story. I didn't know that Jeter story, and Jeter just told the story when George W. Bush went out to throw the first pitch in nine, uh, after 9-11. And to, this is before yeah. he bankrupted the country with his damn good intelligence, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he uh, <laughs> he goes, uh, Jeter goes, you're throwing out the first pitch. He's like, yeah. And he goes, you throwing it from the mound or the front of the mound? And Bush goes, I'm going to throw it from the – I was going to throw it from the front of the mound. And Jeter goes, they're, they're going to boo you. 
they're going to boo you. And he goes, you got to go to the mound. So then Bush is like, all right, I'll go to the mound. So then he goes to the mound. And he said, and as he's walking away, Jeter just goes, don't bounce it. <laughs> They'll boo you too. <laughs> Can I tell you something, Paul? Is there any, there's no better fans than fucking East Coast fans. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the fact that you guys, you're going to boo the president not on any political basis is because he's being a pussy and throwing it from the front. <laughs> I mean, I, as a Red Sox fan, I mean, that's fucking great. I, I 100%, I am behind that. Um, oh, by the way, dude, did you see the fucking dude? I was up last night. I have to sleep in another room, another mattress. Cause my mattress is bad for my back right now. So I'm watching this thing. I'm crying, laughing, punching the thing. Oh God. Did you see the dude jump over the bench? When the judge, so there was a judge in Nevada, this woman, and you just see split screen and the dude's just like this. And she goes, well, yeah, I appreciate that. But, you know, you have too many felon. You have too many things. You're going to have to. And this dude just goes, man, shut up, bitch, dude. He runs as fast as he can from behind the, where he was sitting with his lawyer. Bill, the air he got. He dove over the bench. His legs oh, no. were so high. He, he dove over and sideways. It was like a wrestler. And he grabbed the fucking woman, throws her down. The bailiffs are stopping him and everything. And then there was there was a meme. Somebody made a video of Trump holding a football, going like this, and then throwing it. <laughs> and then the guy jumping over. Dude, I fucking lost control of myself. But, yeah, he jumped. Dude, that guy's going to get like – 30 dude he no he, he already was done he didn't jump dude he fucking it was like he turned into superman it was the craziest shit i'll send he you he threw he threw a uh the the, the a, a body block dude he looked like jimmy superfly snooker off the ropes but and he made it over you know it'd be great if she caught him and then just tony atlas him and fucking over the bench slammed him down no like did the spin like, around oh, and everybody in the court's like yeah <laughs> she put her foot up like hulk hogan and then fucking gives him the fucking what is that the people's elbow oh shit dude um all right bill we got one dude if that happens again you're gonna see judges are gonna start looking like bank tellers oh i dude the level of air was so i can't believe how high he got um yeah that's a shame all the way around man throwing your life away doing that shit the fucking and then her getting hit that's 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 a goddamn shame not saying it's not hilarious Listen, I hope the lady's fine, but it was one of the most hilarious things I've ever witnessed on the internet. I also have to give a shout out to the general public, Paul. Like, they just keep getting funnier and funnier. Like, the general public before the internet was water cooler jokes. You know what I mean? And then the, occasionally a person you see, you could be a stand-up comedian. Dude, like, my favorite thing Instagram is the, 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 the comments. I saw this band. Everybody in the band was obese. And I immediately went to the comments and everybody was naming the band. I mean, they were brilliant. Judas Feast, my befet, Depeche a la mode. <laughs> ah! Jimmy Eight World was my favorite one. <laughs> I was just sitting there by myself. It's a stand up comic. I don't laugh at shit. I had tears rolling down my eyes, going, This is fucking, this is amazing. So oh. shout out to regular people, man. They're fucking hilarious. And in, in the <laughs> Judas Feast, Judas Feast, <laughs> Depeche a la mode. Oh my god! Oh, dude, and, and that's that's only the ones I could remember. It was just oh, they just kept going and going, and then sometimes people would actually name real bands that had food, like Cake. Remember that band? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going the distance. Oh my god, that's fun. He's going for speed, Paul. Uh, we missed you on the tailgate. Like, oh man, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna tell you. I sent you that video when I sat down with that fucking perfect. Bacon, egg, and cheese on an English mushroom made on the flat top grill by Mike Bertolina. And I had the last cappuccino. And I was oh. just sitting there on it. Dude, people were coming over to our tailgate. Going like, wow, you guys, you guys got coffee? You got flat top grill. What, what, what is this thing called here? Dude, That's I got amazing. the ratchet straps. I thought I was going to be, be like losing my shit trying to figure it out. Because I'm, I'm really bad at shit like that. Like, I don't know why. I just, I like. To me, the back of the stove is the front of the stove. Like, I don't know how my brain yeah. is wired, but I yeah. always look at the stove like I'm standing behind a car in traffic. <laughs> so I, I was able to figure that out, and uh, it didn't move even a hair. Like, I was driving so, like, gingerly. 
no pun intended. And I was just thinking like, oh, you know, <laughs> I put all of this shit in here. You know, I, I'm, I'm afraid stuff's going to go flying. Dude, we, had, we even had an extra fucking uh, tank for the uh, for the flat top in case it ran out or if somebody else needed it. And how about the game? Not only did you have a great tailgate. How oh, about it the gets even better. The tailgate down from us, one of the former nose tackles from the, oh. I saw this guy. It was fucking huge. And uh, they came over with shooting the shit. He was on the 97 team, I think, that won the national championship. That's the last time they won it. So how great, Paul. Michigan versus Washington. Hey, uh, Jake the Snake, can you, can you look up when was the last time the Washington Huskies won a, a championship? I don't think in my lifetime they ever won one. That I can remember. I used to remember they went to the Rose Bowl a lot when I was a kid. Was it maybe I, like... There he is. Looking Hot take now. Jake. He's got the scruff going. You got a lady in your <laughs> life? You on the prowl? What's going on with you? I like the oh, new thanks. fucking uh, sex symbol, Jake. Going into the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got, got to get ready. Uh, let's see. Last time they won a championship, they have... Um, 1951. Blame national uh, 1991. They won it 91. Yes, I'm looking up some more details right, now. Well, there you go. Shows you what the fuck I know about sports. Yeah, they went 12 and 0. Um, who is who is their quarterback? Was that Drew Bled? No, Drew Bledsoe was Washington State. Um, good question. Let's see their quarterback. Was that the um, other guy that people drafted instead? Uh, it looks like Mark Brunell. It was Mark like Brunel. Brunel, if you remember Mark that. Mark yeah. Brunel, great quarterback <laughs> for the Jackson uh for the Jacksonville Jags. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and who was their coach? Tom Coughlin. Uh, yeah, Tom cool. Coughlin. Um nice. dude, I'm I am a Trevor Lawrence fan. Me I am too. a Trevor Lawrence fan too. I am a fucking fan. Watching that guy shake off that injury, seeing how bad he wants to win. And I was calling him the good looking zombie. I don't think it's that. I think he's the fucking terminator, man. I I I I didn't I didn't read that look in his eye properly. Look, let's be honest. He's a fucking great looking guy with incredible head of hair. I got a little jealous, Paul. I got my feelings. You know? Um I don't think any sports show that exists has more wins against the number against the book than our show. Do you know that? That's uh, a, I did, that's a, that I've, there's, I mean, unless there's a show out there that I don't know about, but nobody's going against the book this many games. Why are you so, going Suge Knight on us right now, Paul? No. Dancing just, in the videos. I just want to say. All up in all your shit. Uh, um, Come to death row for your picks. All right, Bill, we have one last special and it is the special we have is. Sunday. Wait, wait, wait. Before we go, Paul, who do you like? Michigan or the Huskies? I heard the Huskies have a great coach. I like Michigan because Michigan showed me that Michigan showed me during that Alabama game, dude, if, any, if that team was ever going to give it up, it would have been to Alabama in that game. And they didn't that running back is an absolute animal. That quarterback played good under pressure. They I, played sloppy though. And they made a lot of mistakes. So I'm hoping that that was uh yes, unforced like, fucking errors. That, that thing where they handed off the ball and then he goes to throw it back to him. It doesn't make it to the quarterback. He falls on it. And I do the whole time. I was like, that's it. You, you, you do that once Michigan, against Nick Saban. It's fucking over. Here's why I think Michigan wins. Cause when I watched Michigan's defensive line, get that kid in the backfield a lot, especially at number 55, the big strong thing for the Washington um, Huskies is their quarterback, Mike Penix jr. And I think if you get to that kid, I think that Washington will lose the game, and I think Michigan smells it, and I think they're going to get it. So my pick is Michigan. Yeah, that kid, that kid, I only watched him for uh, like the last three, four minutes of the game, and then I kind of read up on him and battled him back from two ACL injuries. Yep. I think that that guy is a killer. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a pick em. I think the only reason why it's a minus four is because Vegas tries to get money on both sides. Um. I'm excited for both programs because they haven't won in a long time. But as a Michigan fan, this would be crushing to come this close. But I, I would, on the other side, be very excited that Washington won because, uh, you know, everybody deserves Michigan every 30 years to get one, huh? Like you said, though, you made a good point. Michigan made stupid play. Like Michigan, the, the fumble on the one when that kid could have got, that could have been fucking I think they're going to clean that the up. The interception dude. to start the game for he threw it right to him. He's yeah. trying to throw it out of bounds. I saw then that. They, yeah. they, the fumbled punt, 
the fucking yeah. when he threw it back to him. They just they just kept making these stupid fucking. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think they're going to do that this time. I think they're going to clean it. And they were good enough to beat Alabama with those fucking mistakes. How many times has Nick Saban capitalized on those mistakes on another team? Yeah, I think that this was the first time in a while that he didn't seamlessly transition from losing his senior class into bringing or some juniors and seniors in, into like another amazing. The guy's recruitment is on a whole other level. And I know people, oh, they're fucking crooked and blah, blah. The whole fucking thing is crooked. Okay. Yeah. So he's playing the game, you know, better than everybody else. So, I mean, that's just, uh, and give that's Reggie just how Bush it is. his fucking Heisman trophy already. You see this kid, these kids are fucking in penthouses and Ferraris right now. Cause it's legal now. It's fucking. Give okay. The kid well, a- and also Reggie Bush was not running the fucking program, but right. I don't give a fuck what they were doing. He still gained all of those yards. He 100% should have his, his Heisman oh, trophy. Oh, they his such fuck, that, that really is like, I mean, what did they take away from Pete Carroll? Dude, exactly. I guess his championship, but they, he, he didn't have to give up a fucking windbreaker, right? Yeah, and like, then they go after this kid and he has to fucking give back the highest trophy uh, in sports. Give it back to him. They're like they're always like, oh, they bought his mother a Honda Accord. She, somebody, it's like, dude, he doesn't know what the fucking boosters are. It's or a Honda Accord or whatever it is. I had one of those when I wasn't making any money in this business. Jesus fucking Christ! Now, now, no panties drop over a fucking Honda Accord. That's what the car your action? dad drives and drops you off at fucking school. I, I, I agree, man. You can't blame the kid, man. You can't blame the kid. Let's start a petition. I want to know where that Heisman Trophy is. I bet it's in some fucking booster's goddamn living room right now. That's Reggie Bush's. Nah, it's mine. Maybe you guys want some whores? No, Sneaky Pete does coke (laughs) off it. (laughs) All right. uh, No, he doesn't. Don't you fucking talk about my Sneaky Pete like that. Sneaky Pete is a physical specimen. The way he can still run. I'll tell you, Nick Saban can still run. If you think I was cocaine, impressed, Nick Saban in the beginning, the first half and second half, the way he ran out, he runs better than I do. If you think cocaine is not the reason that seventy-three-year-old man's running up and down chewing his gum like that, you got <laughs> no. He can't shut it off, Paul. <laughs> he can't shut it off. The thing about him is he looks like that guy in The Simpsons, the the, the religious guy. Oh, uh, uh, minus Flanders. the mustache, Flanders. Huh? Flanders. He has Flanders, Flanders energy. And then he fucking comes around and you, you just see him, dude. He's chewing that gum. They, they, you know, they do all of this shit for having a turkey neck when you get older. Older. Yeah. I think Pete Carroll figured it out. You just have one fucking piece. Instead of chain smoking, you just keep putting that one piece of Wrigley in there. I don't know, man. Pete Carroll's the type of guy to be like, hey, you going to come by? No, we're going to cook. Up. Bring your wife. Yeah, bring your wife. I decline to comment on that. Listen, what Pete uh, does off the fucking field is what not what I'm talking again? about. What was her name again? Carol? Yeah, bring her. Bring her. Oh, she seemed great. No, he remembers her name. He forgets you and he calls you Stu. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's Paul. Don't make me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you remember, oh, was it Vinny? Oh, no, no. Bring your wife, Carol. All right. We have one more See, special. You wearing show. cologne? Who wears cologne to a cookout? <laughs> A couple more buttons are undone. Yeah, everybody's in like beach. I just came from the gym. (laughs) Everybody's in pool attire. He's got a button down. Your wife disappears. You hear that noise. What's going on in there? I'm just chewing some gum. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. Paulie, Paulie back brace here. All right. All right. Sorry. We have a division rivalry for the special. We have... The Dolphins and the Bills, the Bills need the win. I don't care. They need it. I don't care. The Dolphins are going to win this game outright. Oh. And they're just going to put an end to this fucking whatever the fuck happened to the Bills this year. I think their biggest problem is they're named after me. A lot of people, they think it's like Buffalo Bill. They got the butt. So big misdirection. Um, All right. We'll go Dolphins. Paul, I don't want to go Dolphins. Listen, Paul, you're in the middle of a dynasty right now. (laughs) <laughs> um i love the i love the under all right so listen man let's go with your instincts let's go dolphins let's go under and let's go tyreek hill for a touchdown oh no his house just got burned he's gonna be a little distracted how about two with tonga vialoa to throw one or he could he could be upset um i just feel like they, they they're gonna try to take Tyreek Hill away. I think, as always, 
They might have a little success in the first and second quarter, and then he'll do something in the second half. But is he going to break one? All right, so how about this? Let's go Dolphins under and two to throw one. I like that. All right. Let the Monday Night Spash show, Paul. Let's get another one in it. We only hit one this year. Yeah. Yeah. No more excuses, Paul. We're not not bringing home the bacon for the fans here. Let's go out with a bang. (laughs) Hey, that's what she said when Pete Carroll came over. (laughs) You could hear his chewing from the ring when you have a ring at home. You're just listening. You're like, is that? (laughs) Oh, he's over there. No, you pick up and all you hear is the the gum chewing and then he hangs up. It's an unidentified number. I don't know who that was. I heard the gum. <laughs> uh, uh, we shouldn't disparage the man like no, this. No, it's just funny. Give just, Reggie his goddamn trophy back. Dude, Pete Carroll is such a character that if I just walked in and saw him and shook his hand and he smiled, I'll just burst out laughing, dude. He's such a character, that guy. Like, he's so like... I don't know. There's just something about I love him. Pete Carroll. He's a hard guy to be in a bad mood around. <laughs> you know, like No, and he still he still wants to fuck it. I he, he he wants to get another one, Paul. He's he the guy's in his seven. He's he's the oldest coach in the NFL. You wouldn't know it. I'm telling you. Uh, I love Pete Carroll. There's just always a pack of gum in his khakis. <laughs> that's what makes me laugh. Oh, that's a non-negotiable. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, everybody. You know what? They went to Seattle. He loves chewing gum in the rain. (laughs) Oh, God. As as the NCAA was descending on USC, he's at his home. Hey, let's get out of here. You know, go Northwest. It's always a drought out here. Like a fucking chipmunk. Uh, I was going to say, this is sad. That His this wife is, must have a rule. You, you cannot chew gum in the fucking house. No. She's, Pete, she, the game's over. Spit it out. Oh, yeah. That guy's got to be doing something at home. He's on a treadmill downstairs when they're not. That guy's active. Always. Oh, he's got a fucking TRX band. He brings on the team plane. <laughs> <laughs> they got a little hook right in the, right in the top. He's fucking doing these, laying down, oh, pulling shit. himself up. Um. I was going to say, this is sad that it's the last show, but we still got the playoffs where I shit the bed last year. So we got, uh, we'll be back for, oh. Well, I need you on one road gig this year. Which one? Let's do it. I'm, I'm playing Carolina and then I'm playing uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm bringing Vinny Mark. Oh. All right. No, Vinny, Vinny is, he's, he, 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 he plays a lot of golf. Things were said. Okay. It's you and me versus him, a little skins game here. All right. All right. So we got to work this guy, you know, for some handicaps here because he is, you know, I'm trying to protect his image here because I know how he makes a lot of his money. He's, <laughs> well, a, he's a real, he's, he's a decent golfer. All right. Well, Paul, has got to get his back. Speaking of handicap, I got to get my back right, but then we're going to do it. Um, all right. When is that? When is that? I don't know. Spring. I hope so. I March or whatever. He's already hit me up. He's very excited. Because he feels he's going to make more money playing golf against us than doing two shows opening for me. And you know, Paul, I pay. I pay my openers. <laughs> uh, I want everybody to be happy. Um, all right, everybody. That's the show. Um, please bet responsibly. And if you want to play along with our special and with our picks, go to the BetMGM app, download it, use our code uh, BURR, B-U-R-R. It's as simple as that. You put uh, up to $10, as little as $10 in to start, okay? And um, if you lose your first bet, you will get $1,500 in uh, bonus bets uh, after the, the initial bet gets settled. Okay, so bet responsibly, have fun, download the BetMGM app, the best app out there. Let's go. We got for our special, the Dolphins to win the game, under 49 and a half, and Tua uh, to throw a touchdown against the Bills, division rival. There you go. This has been week 18. We'll be back next week for the, oh, my God, for wild card weekend. Oh. Playoffs? Playoffs. Are you kidding me? Playoffs? We'll be back. Uh, that's the Who show, everybody. to win a game? Take care.